Welcome to the week 1 of Flutter and Fire Best Developer Bootcamp. I am very glad to have you here. Let's start our journey towards the success of achieving extraordinary results. So let's get started with the very first point, what is Flutter? Flutter is a fast growing, powerful UI toolkit created by Google. It allows us to declaratively define UIs in the form of reusable components which are so called widgets and these widgets in the native android development are called views and in native ios development they are called ui views and the very interesting thing that attracts developers towards the flutter framework is using flutter you can build for any screen using just single code base dart either it's android ios mac os linux web or even windows you can build for any screen or platform using just single code base dart. And that is what which makes Flutter stand apart from other app development frameworks. And in future episodes, you will get to know about what amazing things we can create with Flutter throughout this bootcamp. So now that you know what is Flutter, so it's best time to start with why. Why you should choose Flutter for app development. So there are several reasons you might learn and choose Flutter for app development. The first one is performance. The Flutter apps are incredibly fast and responsive. This is because Flutter has a technique of hot reload, which means that the UI is updated instantly as you make changes in your code. Unlike native and write development where we have just the previews and to see the actual results on the emulator we have to rebuild the whole process and see the actual final results on the emulator. But this is not the case in Flutter. We have the hot reload technique. So just make changes in your code, hot reload and there you go you got your changes reflected on the emulator. And the next thing is simplicity. Learning to flutter is very simple and easy. If you have knowledge and experience of object oriented programming, so you will be able to pick up flutter very quickly. And the next thing is cross platforms. Flutter apps can be compiled to both Android and iOS. This means that you have to write code in just Dart programming language and this can be deployed on both platforms Android and iOS. So that for some reasons you might want to choose Flutter for app development. It's fast and responsive. It's simple to learn and is cross platforms from just single code base you can build for both platforms Android and iOS. And now macOS, Linux, web and even Windows are also on the stable version of Flutter. Flutter has been growing rapidly in popularity in recent years. In 2070, there were only few thousand Flutter developers. But by 2023, there are over 2 million Flutter developers worldwide. And this growth is because of the factors including Flutter speeds, portability and ease of use. Now that you know what is Flutter and why you should choose Flutter for app development. Let's get started with setting up Flutter SDK and begin our journey towards achieving extraordinary results. To set up Flutter SDK in your Mac OS, simply move to your browser and search for Flutter and click this very first link download Flutter SDK and this will take you in here build apps for any screen then you can go for get started and here you will find the install for windows mac os linux and chrome os so we can go for the mac os in here you will found the system requirements so you can check your and accordingly install the flutter sdk for your mac os so first of all to set up the flutter sdk for your mac os and if you are using the apple silicon mac so you have to run this command in order to install the rosita translation environment after it has been done then you can go for getting the sdk if you have the Intel Mac OS, you can go for this one. And again, if you have the Apple Silicon, you can go for this one. So after downloading the Flutter SDK, it will be stored in the downloads in your Mac OS. Then you can go and run this unzip downloads and the Mac OS SDK to unzip that SDK that you have just downloaded. So you have to open your terminal and simply Pass this unzip the downloads Flutter Mac OS the SDK that you have just downloaded. So after unzipping this SDK, close your terminal and go for the finder. After your SDK has been unzipped and your downloads, you will see something like this Flutter. 
And inside this, there will be the bin directory analysis YAML, dot documents dot YAML, and all of the other directories and files like dev, examples, flutter console dot bat, etc. So once you have this flutter SDK, you have to move this from downloads to your user file. If you don't have user file directly in your finder, so you can go from here by clicking this go and simply go for this computer and then go for the Macintosh HD and you will find the users in here and your user home folder in here. So then paste your Flutter SDK by creating a directory with your desired name. As I have the Flutter dev and inside I have the Flutter. So simply you have to download the Flutter SDK for your Mac OS and simply move it from downloads to your home folder and store it in some folder of your desired name as I have the Flutter dev. Then now as you have the Flutter SDK, now you can go for setting up the path. So in the browser, you will also find the instruction for setting the path in your Mac OS. You will find the update your path. Click this. This will take you to update your path headline. And here you can see if you are using bash, you can use the home bash profile and bash RC and if you're using Z shell, you can use this Z shell RC to set up the path for your Flutter SDK in your Mac OS. So as we are using the Z shell, you can see in here. So simply we have to create one file named ZSHRC. So you can create this directly in your home. You can do this by touch dot ZSHRC. And if you enter then your z shell rc file will be created so i already have created one so i'm not going to create another one so after running this command you will have a file same like this then you can open it and simply from the browser you can copy this to set up the path for your flutter sdk here you can see the export path and the path of your flutter directory you can copy this and paste it inside here so I already have one, so I'm not going to set it again. For you, you have to paste it like this. And then to get your path of your Flutter SDK, you have to go for your Flutter dev in my case and go for the Flutter. And to get the path to the bin, you have to click on two fingers on your Mac touchpad and you will see this window appeared and simply hold your option button in your keyboard of mac os and here you can see the copy bin as path name copy this and you will have a path of your flutter sdk to bin and your path will look something like this let me show you in the terminal here your path to your flutter sdk so after this you have to paste your path in here after the column the Flutter SDK path and then save the Z shell RC file. And there you go. The Flutter SDK path for your Mac is successfully set up. Then you can go for the terminal again and run the command of Flutter doctor. After this, you will see your Flutter has been set up in your Mac OS and all of the other information and write tool chain, Xcode develop, Chrome and write studio version, VS code and all of that stuff. So initially if you set up Flutter SDK and you don't have the Xcode and also the other licenses, so you will have some crosses in here that you don't have this. So you have to also download and set up all of these for your Flutter. For example, the Xcode and the Cocoa boards in especially Mac OS. So I currently have no issues found. So if you are doing it initially, you might have issues here. So you have to fix them and to fix them. You'll also find the information in the same browser where we were setting up our SDK from the Flutter official documentation. Here we have the platform support. So to install Xcode and you don't have the Xcode and here you are getting that you don't have the Xcode. So you can download the Xcode from the web and also from the Mac App Store. And then you can use this command to configure the Xcode in your command line tools. And you're good to go. Next, you will also be able to open the simulator after installing the Xcode. And then you also have to install the Coca Pods. Here you'll find the information about the Coca Pod here. You have to install the Coca Pods by running this command 
and these coca ports are especially for apps that depends upon the plugins with the native ios code so again if you're using the apple silicon mac so you have again run to this command and for the android setup you have this documentation written by flutter developers so you can also use this to set up for android in your mac os so that was it for setting up the flutter sdk in your mac os to set up flutter sdk for your windows os you have the option for windows so simply go for it inside you will see the system requirements and here get the sdk so from here you can download the flutter sdk for windows and the same flutter windows stable.zip will be downloaded and simply extract this flutter sdk to your local disk c in your desired name folder such as i have this source and i have extracted the flutter sdk inside and i got this flutter and we have the same files as we had in the mac os when we were setting up the flutter sdk for our mac os so inside we have the same bin file dev examples and the analysis yaml here and all of these files so after your sdk has been downloaded and is extracted in your local disk c in windows you have to set the path again to set the path in windows you have to open your search in windows and go for the environment variables here inside the environment variables you will go for the environment variables this is the system property setting so inside this we have the environment variables and here go for the path and edit the path simply i already have the inside the local disk c inside the source i have flutter and bin so it means i have successfully set up the flutter sdk for my windows so to copy the path you have this simply click this search tab and copy this path from here you can go to the bin and then copy it so this is the flutter sdk path so you can set this path in your environment variables by going inside the path and add the new and paste your path inside and click ok apply and you are good to go so after this your path will be set up and your flutter sdk is successfully set up in windows also so this time you can open the cmd and run the flutter doctor to check how is it going so again if there is some missing the flutter doctor will tell you to install the requirements and then you will be good to go with flutter so in my case i have three issue in android studio unable to find the bundle java file and unable to find the bundle java version and also i have visual studio not installed so i have to install the visual studio code and also the desktop development with c tools from the vs code build tool so you will find the visual studio code build tools from where you're downloading the visual studio code and for these two issues if you have the same issues so you can follow this answer in the stack overflow so you'll find the solution in here for the windows as windows is not my development environment and i don't have the updated versions of everything so that is why i got these errors so i hope so you'll not have these errors if so then you can visit the stack overflow question answers you'll find the link in the video description so that's all for setting up the flutter sdk in your windows download the sdk extract it somewhere and set the path in the environment variables and there you go your sdk is set up and then the only thing you have to do is to install some requirements for example again we don't have the visual studio code build tools of the desktop development c so that is why we are getting this issue and also these issues that is because our android studio is not updated or their bundle is not fine so the solution is also here in the question of the stack overflow that i just show you so you will find the solution in the answer of that question in the stack overflow that i have give the link in the video description so that's it for setting up flutter sdk in windows before learning to dart you must know what is dart dart is an open source client optimized general purpose programming language that is used to develop fast apps on almost any platform the platforms can be mobile web and desktop i said three terms open source client optimized and general purpose so what that means let's break it down by open source i means that the source code of the dart is 
publicly available and anyone can contribute and report the issues. This openness encourages collaboration, transparency, and community involvement. And the next thing is client optimized. By client optimized, I mean that Dart is mainly used on client sites, particularly for web and mobile apps. In case of web, the Dart programming language is compiled to highly optimized JavaScript and in case of mobile apps, a Dart is commonly used with Flutter framework to create visually appealing and efficient cross-platform apps. And the final thing I said is general purpose. By general purpose, I mean that Dart is not limited to a specific domain or area. It can be used for a wide range of programming tasks, from web development to mobile app development to server-side programming. And there are other key features of Dart programming language such as Dart use JIT or just-in-time compilation for fast development and hot reloading. And it also uses the ahead-of-time or AOT compilation for efficient execution in production. Dart is also an object-oriented programming language which allows developers to create reusable and modular code using objects and classes. It also supports asynchronous programming for long-running tasks, especially for the tasks like network request. Dart programming language also has a package manager called pub where developers can easily share and consume packages, libraries, and dependencies from various programming backgrounds. For more on Dart, head on over to dart.dev and with that understanding, let's get started with our crash course of Dart programming language. So as an editor, we will use Dartpad which is an online editor tool for Dart which executes Dart code. You can use any other editor you like but I would recommend to use this editor for just learning Dart fundamentals because this is online, lightweight and do not require any additional setup. Just search for Dartpad on the internet browser and there you go. And it has some setting preferences like new pad. When you click this, this window will appear in front of you. And here is Dart and Flutter. Like you can run Dart code as well as Flutter code in here. So let's cancel it. We have this reset option to reset the code that we have wrote. Like if I write something else in here, ty and reset it. Hit OK. So it's resetted and the ty has gone from here and here is the format like if our code is not formatted so we will click this and this will format our code so now when i click this this will say format successful and the open bracket becomes like this and now it's formatted and here is the option for install sdk to install sdk on your device and use it in other editors like vs code atom and some other and here are some samples in here for flutter and also for dart like we have the fibonacci sequence sample http request sample and hello world sample and here are some other samples for flutter like the counter sunflower draggables and some other and we have the hello world dart sample like when i click this this will give us the hello world sample for dart and here is the github when you click this, you can log into GitHub and also do some other things in here. And when you click this three dots, here is the share to share this page and Dart pad on GitHub and Dart dev and Flutter dev website. And also down here, we have the version of Flutter like this is the latest version of Flutter and also for the Dart. And here we are using the staple channel of Flutter version 3.3.9 and dart version 2.18 and this is our hello world sample so now run this code this is a button to run the code and we got this output in this console like if we run some code this will give us the output in here and this documentation is for to show the documentation for some function in the code like if you have used any other editors like android studio IntelliJ IDE VS Code when you hover some function in there. So a small pop-up appears and there were some documentation of that specific function. Like if I click this print in here. So you can see there comes its documentation. Void print it accepts an object and prints a string representation of the object to the console. And here is the open library docs. When you click it, this will take you to its documentation 
and it's coming from the dark core library which give us the built-in tabs collections as i said and this other core functionality of dart so you can read this documentation of developer to get to know more about this core library functions of dart so now let's again back to the dart pad so like this we can check the documentation of any function and some class so that was it for the dart pad so now it's time to start our dart basic fundamentals so first of all we have this main method in dart or let's just remove these four from here and also this documentation and also this unused curly brace from here so in every app we must have a top level this main functions which serves as an entry point for the app and this void as a function return type means that does not return any value like that's the function and its type is void it means that it does not return any value but that's the main function of dart that every app must have and it serves as an entry point for the app inside this we will write the code and that will be executed and will give us the output in the console so first of all let's talk about the dart data types so dart supports some data types that are strings numbers booleans lists and map so now what is string string is a sequence of character that is represented in the double quotation or single quotation like any value in this double quotation is string and numbers the numbers are then divided into two parts that are integer and double integers are some numeric value that can be negative or positive and double are the decimal value like the point value some floating value like 1.0 5.0 9.9 and anything like this and the booleans are the data types which can either be true or false and list is a collection of some data objects and its synonym is an array in other programming languages and next we have the map and maps are key value pairs if you are familiar with any other programming languages like javascript python and others in javascript we have the objects and in the python we have the dictionaries and in dart they are called maps they are key value pairs so these are the data types that dart programming language support and next let's see how we can declare a variable in dart programming language so here we will comment out these are the comments use the slash and in front of it when you write something that code or that text will not be executed and these are the comments so here we will write the comment create variable so how we can create variable s dot statically type language so we will use the specific type for a variable to create so first of all a variable act as a container for values in a program like a container to store some bunch of data inside so let's create a string variable its type will be string and its name is will be let's say only name will be equal to string represent the sequence of character which will be wrapped in the quotation marks and semicolon so inside this we will name this steve so that's how we can initialize a variable in dart programming language or create a variable and its type is string now let's declare one more variable and its type will be integer so right after this we are going to have i and t and let's say num or let's say number equal to 5 or it can also be minus 5 or 0 so that's an integer and next double will be some floating or decimal value like let's say point number we will name this variable this will be equals to 5.5 and next let's declare the boolean variable and in dart programming language we use int for integer and bool for boolean and its name will be is done like using for some work if some work is done so it's true or false so we have the true and false in dart programming language and these are the only values for booleans it can be either true or false and the list are list the collection of some data or objects let's say list of bananas equals to a list 
and this is going to accept banana 1 banana 2 and banana 3 so this is the list of bananas which contains 3 banana 1 2 and 3 and we represent the list in this large brackets and each thing in the list is called an element and each element is separated using the comma and next we have the map map are key value pairs if you are familiar with some other programming language you might definitely familiar with the json format or in python dictionary or in javascript objects these are key and value pairs so the map will be like let's say user data will be equal to we represent map inside the curly braces and here its value will be name and let's say john so that's the first key and value pair the key and value pairs are separated using this colon so the string which becomes first from this colon is key and next string which comes in front of this column is value and we will also separate these key value pairs using comma so now that's one key value pair and next we are going to have its edge edge is 5 so that's the map key and value pairs and that are the data types of dart programming language and that's how we initialize variables or create variables in dart programming language and if the type of the variable is not explicitly specified the variables type is dynamic like we have the keyword where if you use this and name our variable let's say list of apples that's the name of the variable equals to and you put square brackets that is also the list so we can do apples or apple 1 and apple 2 so that is also the list and the same can be for like where and let's say value equal to 5.5 so that's now the double and also we can use the keyword dynamic for this so this will be also the dynamic value and for where this will be also the same and next we have some keywords of final and const these variables are used to declare the constant value like if we do we have the final variable and that's a and that's equal to 5 and again if we reinitialize this variable and do a equal to 6 and put semicolon here so you can see a small red line down the a so when i hover this it is saying the final variable a can only be set and at once meaning that it is constant value it cannot be changed but in case of other values like we have this point double point number and we do point number equal to six so that's not giving us the compile time error that it is not possible just because these are not the constants so let's remove this and the const is the same we cannot do this the now it is saying constant variables can't be assigned a value so that's how this final and const variables are and these variables are also called the identifiers and there are some rules for declaring variables the first rule is the variables can contain numbers let's type the rules also in here so one is can contain alphabets and numbers like when we declare a variable of string and we name it b so that's an alphabet and we say 5 6 so that's okay equal to 5 but this will be in the string just because its type is string so that's okay to use alphabets and numbers in the variable names and the rule number 2 is the variables cannot contain spaces and special characters like let's remove this from here and write one more comment rule 2 and also make it rule and this rule will be cannot contain spaces and special characters so like if we have a variable of again the string 
and we do a space b equal to 5. So that's not correct. It is saying undefined name b and also we cannot use the special characters in the variable names like we have a b c the variable name and we use the modulus in here. So that's not correct. You can see so many ears on the right hand side and we cannot use also this in here and we can also not use these parentheses brackets in the middle of the brackets like these special characters and inside this rule too we cannot use any special characters except the underscore and the dollar sign like we can use the dollar sign in here so this is not going to be a problem so let's wrap it in the string characters to remove this error and we can use the dollar signs in the variable names and also these underscores in here so this is not going to cause problems just because we can use these in our variables and rule 3 is variable cannot start from numbers like we cannot do we have this variable we cannot put 6 before this this will cause error like undefined name so we cannot start a variable name from the number so these are some rules for declaring variables and let's also remove this for this const so we have talked about data types and the variables and now we can also print these variables we have the print function and if we print the variable of name and run this so we will get this Steve in the console and these error are because they are all saying the variables we have created are not used so that's because the warnings are in here and in the console you can see we got the Steve if we print the name in here and let's print these bananas and run this so we will get the list of bananas banana 1 2 and 3 and if we print the value this is our dynamic variable so this will give us this sam 5.5 so to check the type of this value if it's double or not so we can do value dot runtime type and run this so instead of the value now we will get its type you can see it's double as the value is by 5.5 and if we remove the 5.5 and again run this so now this time we will get the console integer you can see integer and what if there were string so we will get in the console string so now what we have done we have talked about data types we have created data types for the variables we create the variables we talk about the rules of the variables and we also print the values so now it's time to move to the operator so what is operator in mathematics and computer programming, an operator is a character that represents a specific mathematical or logical action or process. And in Dart programming language, we have different operators. So if you are familiar with any other programming language, you might be familiar with these operators. If not, so that's why you are here. We are going to learn the operators of Dart programming language. So first of all, let's comment out here. What are the operators? we have in the Dart programming language. So first operator is arithmetic operator and the second is equality or relational operator and on the third number we have the type test operator to test the type of the variable and next on the fourth number we have the assignment operator and last but not the least we have the logical operator and next we also have the bitwise operator and that is for some other binary works so that's not really important most of the times in development so we are going to explore these operators now so first of all what is arithmetic operator the arithmetic operators are like addition subtraction multiplication deviation modulus and the that division which returns an integer value but not in the decimal and we have the increment and also the decrement 
so these are the arithmetic operator so first of all let's perform some operations on some values but before this let me tell you one more thing we are going to have the values like 5 plus 5 or like 6 minus 2 and any operators between the values so these values at both sides are called the operand and the add sign between them is called an operator which is an arithmetic operator so the 5 and 5 are operands and the between addition sign is called an operator now let's remove this and we are going to have an integer variable which name will be num will be equal to 5 and we are going to have another variable will be num2 or let's also name it num1 equal to 10 so we got two operands stored in the integer type variables named num1 and num2 now let's perform the addition arithmetic operation on these two operands stored in the variables num1 and num2 so we are going to have another variable its type will be int and will be result equal to and in this result we will add these two variables like num1 add num2 and now we will print the result so what we have done we perform the addition operation on two operands num1 and num2 which values are 5 and 10 and lastly we print the result so now run this code and this will give us the answer of 50 so we got the answer 50 and we can also perform the subtraction and when we run this this will give us the output of minus 5 like subtract 10 from the 5 so we will get the minus 5 and we can also perform the multiplication on them and now run this so the answer is 5 multiplied by 10 we got 50 and next we have the divide to divide num1 on num2 but as a 5 divide on 10 so this will give us answer in the decimal so we have to change type of result to double so the answer will be in double so now run this code and we will get the answer in decimal 0.5 so that was the gy and now next is the modulus to get the modulus of these two numbers now run this and there is an error it is saying the value of int can't be assigned to okay so now we have to change its type to int just because its result will be in the integer now run this so we will get the answer 5 and next we have this divide so now you can see this divide is not saying to change the result type to double just because this divide will return the result in the integer and will remove the decimal point so now run this so we will get the 0 instead of 0 0.5 so it removed the 0 0.5 from here and give us the result only 0 just because this divide removes the decimal point from the result so now we have the increment and the decrement so now remove this 2 from here and put the increment operators before this num1 and run this so we have the value of 5 in here and it, it will increment the num by 1 and will give us the answer 6 in here and when we put double minus in here the decrement operator and run this so this will give us 4 so that was it for the arithmetic operators and that's how this works and next we have the equality and relational operator so let's comment these out and also start working on this equality or relational operators so this equality and relational operators are the operators of greater than or less than greater than or equal to less than or equal to and finally not equal to and this return the boolean value like the relational or the equality operator to check if the one value is greater than the other value so the result will be true if it's actually the first value is greater than the second value so now let's copy these or let's uncomment them and cut this from here and paste it in here so now it's time for 
use these equality or relational operators. So we have num1 and num2 having the value of 5 and 10 and remove this result from here and in the print statement we will compare these num1 and num2 using the equality and relational operators. So we will say num1 is greater than num2 and print it simply. So the num1 is greater than num2? No, it's not. So in the answer, we will get the answer of false. Let's run it and check it also. So we got false in here just because num1 is not greater than num2 and when we do num1 is less than num2 and again run this so we will get answer of true and these operators also use in the if else condition which will come after these operators so you will get to know also about these and if you are familiar with any other programming language so you might be familiar with also these if else conditional statements so the next operator of equality is greater than or equal to so this operator only check or will return the true value if in case the first value is greater than the second value and this operator will only return true if the first value is less than the second value as we had in the previous condition before this one and this condition or this operator relational or equality operator will return true only when the first value is greater than or equal to the second value only this time this will return true otherwise this will return false and for this less than or equal to it's the opposite of this like when like when the first value is less than or it's equal to the second value so only in this case this will return true otherwise false and in this not equal to operator means this will only return true when first value is not equal to second value if it was equal so it will return false if it was not equal so it will obviously return true so first we have checked the greater than and also the less than and now we are checking greater than or equal to so now we are checking if number one is greater than or equal to num2 so return our result in the console so let's check num1 is greater than or equal to num2 num1 is neither greater than nor equal to num2 so when we run this this will give us false just because both conditions are false and what if it was 5 and 5 now num1 is not greater than num2 but num1 is equal to num2 so this time this will also return true just because this condition of equality is true you can see we got the answer true and now let's also change it to 10 and check the other condition num1 is less than or equal to so the first condition is true num1 is less than but num1 is not equal to num2 so when we run this this will also give us the answer true just because the first condition is of less than is true so you can see we got true and again in this if we make this 10 to 5 and this time this will also be true and we got true in here so the last operator is not equal to so when you put not equal to so this will return true just because num1 is not equal to num2 and run this and we will get the answer true in here and we get false just because we have changed the value of num2 to 5 and when we again change its value to 10 so obviously now num1 is not equal to num2 so this will give us the answer true this gives us the answer false just because i changed the num2 value to 5 and this was equal and that's why this gave us the value or the result false and now these are not equal so we got the answer true just because we are saying it's not equal to 2 yes it's not equal to true we got the result true so that was our operators of equality and relational and you will also get to know more about these relational or equality operators when you use this in the conditional statements and next operator is type test operator so in the type test operators we have the operators of is and is not first is so we will say num1 is int and when we run this so this will give us the answer true just because the num1 type is int and now when we change the type of the num1 and also the value of the num1 to decimal and type now when we run this so we will get the answer of false just because now the value and the type is not integer so we got the false and now when we 
make this not means the num1 is not int so this will be false just because num1 is not int it's double run this so we will get the answer true and there we go we got the answer true and that was really simple type test operators and next we have the operators for assignment so the assignment operators are first operator is the operator we have used so many times that is equal to like we are assigning the 5.5 value to this num1 variable and this is first assignment operator and next assignment operator is plus equal to meaning that add the particular value to the variable and next is subtract equal to and fourth is divide equal to and now that's it so we have the double num1 with the value of 5.5 so let's comment this out and only use this num2 for now so let's also create one more variable and name it result its type is int make it equal to num2 plus equal to 1 and put semicolon in here and also print this num2 so what we have done we have 10 value in the num2 we have created another variable and in the num2 we have add one more value so it will become 11 so now run this and we will get the answer 11 and we can also do minus or subtract equal to so this will become 9 and also for multiply we can do or we have not write the multiply in here so after this we can do multiply equal to also for a variable or the variable value now run this so 10 will be multiplied by 1 so it will be only 10 like if we do multiply by 5 so it will be now multiplied by 5 and will become 50 so that's how we can use the assignment operator and the last one is divide and equal to now run this and this will throw an error just because we have to change the return type of it to double because it will return the value in the decimal. This will be 5.5 or let's say 5.0. And that's it. But there is still an error just because we have to change this num2 also to double. Now, so that was it. Now run this. So we will get the answer 2 just because 10 divided by 5, 5 twos are 10. And if it was some other value, so it answer will be in the decimal like 5.5 and run this. So we will get answer in decimal 1.818181 and so on. So that was our assignment operator. And the last operator we are going to explore is the logical operator. Logical operator. So in the logical operator, we have the operators of and operator, which is represented by double and and we have the or operator which is represented by this pipe and the not operator which is represented by only this sign so now when these operators is going to return some value or true or false so first of all we will talk about the and operator the and operator so for and operator we have this small table in here so one and one equal to one means if both conditions are equal to true so only in case we are going to have the true answer otherwise the answer will be false no matter one of the condition like this are true and if both were false so the answer will also be false now let's apply it on the code and remove this first double value and make this value to int and in the print statement we will check if num2 is greater than 5 or let's also create another num1 in here or let's uncomment this num1 we already have in here and change its decimal value to only integer and now we will check if num2 is greater than or let's say num1 is greater than num2 and if num1 is less than num2 so the first condition is true no it's not true the num1 is not greater than num2 but num1 is less than num2 and the second condition we have the 
num1 is less than num2 so we have this condition satisfied the first condition is false and the second condition is true so the answer will is zero so it means the answer will be false so if you don't believe me let's run and see the answer so we got the answer false just because one of the condition is false and in case if we got the first condition true and second condition false so the answer will also be false and in case if you got both conditions false so the answer will also be false but in case if you got two conditions true means both conditions true so the second condition is already true and the first condition to make it true we we have to do the less than also so now in this two condition we are checking the same conditions or let's do not equal to so first condition num1 is not equal to 2 it's true and the second condition num1 is less than num2 it's true because num1 is less than num2 and num1 is not equal to num2 so both conditions are true and when we run this so we will get the answer true just because now this condition is satisfied so that's how our and operator works and next we have the or operator so for the or operators we have the table we will get only true answer whenever both condition are true and we will get the true answer whenever when one of the condition is also true and we will also get the answer of false whenever the both condition are false so let's also try it out remove this and and use this pipe for the end so first condition is true second is also true so in case we will get true just because in or this first condition is satisfied so we got the answer true and let's say one is equal equal to num1 is equal equal to num2 the first condition is false and the second is true so we will run this and we will get the answer now this condition is satisfied if one condition is true so the answer will be true so now let's also do this num1 is greater than num2 so now both conditions are false and run this so we will get the answer false just because now this condition is satisfied and the not operator is the operator which makes the true answer false and the false answer true like let's remove these two variables from here and create a variable of boolean and let's say is light equal to false means light is false or off so we will do is light first of all let's print it and run this code so obviously we will get the answer in the console false and we got false now when we put the not operator before this so we will get the answer true it means not light not is light so change its value to true so you can see we got the true value so that's what it does so when we change the value of false to true and run this again so we will get the answer of false so that's how all these operators works first we have talked about the arithmetic operators some addition subtraction multiplication division modulus and this division for getting the non-decimal value increment and decrement equality and relational operator for checking the greater and the less values greater than equal to values and check if the value is not equal to the other value and the type test if one value type is in double string etc and the assignment operator for assigning the values like we are assigning one value by adding it like we have done for the 10 we have plus equal to one so we have add one value to the variable and the same for all of these and this operators we use so many times to assign one value to a variable and these logical operators works like this if both conditions are true only the answer will be true for and otherwise false and in the or if some of the condition or both conditions are true so we will only get the answer false otherwise if both conditions are false so we will get the answer of false and not operator to convert the true to false and false to true so that was it also for the operators so before going forward for the conditional statements in the equality operator we have one more operator that is equal equal to to check if the value is equal equal to the other value only in this case this will return the true now let's remove this and test it also suppose we have the variable num1 and also the variable of num2 and next we have a print statement and inside this we check num1 is equal equal to num2 
So in this case num1 is not equal equal to num2 so when we run this this will give us the answer of false. So now when we change the value of num2 to 5 and again run this now num1 is equal equal to num2 so the answer is true. So now it's time to go for the if else or the conditional statements. So let's remove all these data from here. So the conditional statements are like the decision making. Conditional statements or decision make. This includes if else and if else later. And its syntax is like if some condition is true, so do something in here. And in the else, do something else like if the specified condition in here is true do this and if it was not true do what is in the else condition and for that we have the keyword of if and else in our dart programming language so now let's remove this syntax or let's comment this syntax in here so using this syntax we will do our work on this conditional statements or decision making conditions so first let's do the same as we did for the arithmetic operators int num1 equal to 5 and int num2 equal to 10. Now we will check if the num1 is greater than num2. So what you have to do print and say num1 is greater than num2. And if this condition was not true in the else condition what you have to do is to copy this and paste it in the else and now say num1 is less than num2 so num1 is less than num2 and the first condition is not satisfied so this will execute the else condition when we run this and this will say num1 is less than num2 just because the if condition is not true and you can see we got the num1 is less than num2 and so now if we say num1 is equal equal to num2 and in the print statement v2 num1 is equal to num2 and also change their values and run this so now first if condition is true so we will get this first print statement in our console and you can see we got num1 is equal to num2 now the first condition was true and we can do some other thing like remove this and Let's suppose we have only one variable for now and the num1 has the value of 12 and here we will check if the num1 modulus of 2 was equal equal to 0. So print this is even number and in the else condition simply print this is odd number. So what this condition means? It means if the number in our num1 variable divided by 2 and its reminder is 0. So you have to print e this is even number just because each even number that is divided by 2 its reminder comes 0. So in this case we will print the this is even number otherwise this will be odd number so when we run this we will get the answer this is even number just because when we divide 12 by 2 so the reminder becomes 0 at the end so when we do this 13 so when we th divide 13 by 2 its reminder do not becomes 0 so this will say this is odd number you can see we got this odd number and before for 12 it was this is even number and these condition statements used for so many condition checks or decision making like now also uncomment this so one more condition here we can use is first we will change the num1 to total marks of a student so the total marks are let's say 1000 and the top 10 marks by students are let's say 500 so on these two variables we will check the conditions like if the op 10 marks were greater than or equal to 900 and the op 10 marks of the student is less than total marks so what you have to do is to print your grade is a 
and now here we will use the fl slider so to make fl slider we are going to have multiple conditions like else f so there will becomes another condition like let's copy this and paste it right here we will check if the obtain marks of the student is greater than or equal to 700 and the obtain marks are less than total marks so we will copy this print statement and paste it in the else f so we will see your result is b and also we again will check if else if the obtain marks of the student is greater than or equal to 500 and obtain marks are less than total marks if the both conditions were true we will print your grade is C and in the else condition we will do nothing but only print let's say better luck next time so we got a letter of if else like first this will check if the obtain marks of the student these total marks were greater than or equal to 900 and the obtain marks are less than total marks so in case if both conditions were true so the grade of the student will be a and in the else we are again checking if the obtain marks of the student are less than or greater than or equal to 700 and obtain marks are again less than total marks if both conditions were true the students will be grade b and the same for the grade c and if these three conditions were false so any else condition we will do or print the statement better like next time now run this the top 10 marks are 500 so it means this condition is true so the grade of the student will be c so you can see we got the your grade is c and the third conditions were true and if we check and if we now change the obtain marks to let's say 400 now no conditions here is true now when we run this we will get this else statement it is saying better luck next time and if we do 850 so now second condition is true and we will get the grade b and that's how you can also create the system like this using the fls conditions and these are really useful conditions which were used in real time problem and you will get to know more about these when you go for the real app development of our flutter so that was it for the fls condition and at the alternative of if else conditions we have the switch statements in our dot programming language but these switch statements compare integers and string instead of boolean the syntax of switch statements will be something like this like first we are going to have the switch keyword and on some integer or string value we will switch and when the case matches to the value then we will perform some actions on the different cases so now let's see with the real example of it first of all we will initialize a variable in here so now we will switch on this date and open the body and then we will check for the cases if the case was one so open the body and print today is one date put semicolon here and break this statement so copy this statement and paste it five more times so we got these cases in the switch statement five times and if the case was one so we will say today is that one if the case was two so we will say today is two dead and if the case was three so we will say today is three dead and if the case was four so we will say today is four dead and if the case was five so we will say today is five dead and now you can see the code is not formatted so we have the option here to format our code so when we click this so this will format our code which will looks really good after formatting it so we have the dead variable of integer and now we are switching on the dead variable we are saying if any case matches, simply print that statement and break it break means just terminate their switch statement and do not check the other one just break it terminate and print that statement which we have done in here for all of these cases so now date is 5 so the fifth case will be match and 
we will get the output of today is 5 dead. So now run this code to get the output from the switch statement. So you can see in the output we got today is 5 dead just because the dead value is equal to 5 and we perform switch on the integer value. And now if I change it to 3 and now again run this code. So now this case is true. So this will check for 1, 2 and when the 3 is scam and it checks the cases 3 of the dead in the switch so it will print that statement and just break this and do not check the other ones so we got the today is 3 dead in here so that was switching on the integer value now remove this code from here and change this dead to day and also change its value to monday and now there will be an error just because we have to change the type also to string just because we cannot assign a string value to an integer type variable and that is because the dart is type safe language so now we will switch on this day and we will check different cases to check which day is for monday like we will say case one not one but the case monday for the monday we will print today is monday and simply break it and before this monday we are going to have the case of sunday and we will do today is sunday now copy this monday case and paste it right after this five more times like we got one two three four and five and now change this to monday to tuesday and paste it also in here and if the case was wednesday so we will say today is wednesday and if the case was thursday so we will print today is thursday and if the case was friday so we will do today is friday and if the case was saturday so we will say today is saturday and now the code is not formatted so simply click this format and our code will be formatted now here we have the monday and when we run this the case will be matched to this second statement and we will get today is monday now when we change it to let's say friday and run it so we will get the case print statement of this friday now the case match friday we got today is friday and you can also make your simple calculator using the switch statements or also you can do it by the if else condition statements so now let's remove it and simply build a small calculator using these switch statements so first of all here we are going to have a string variable and its name will be operator equals to let's say add and then we will switch on this operator and if the case of the operator was add so what we will do here we are also going to have two more variables that will be of type int num1 equal to 5 and int num2 equal to 10 and if the case was add simply do print num1 plus num2 and simply break the statement now copy this and there is an error just because we have to put the colon in here now copy this statement and we are going to have the first statement just because we are going to build a simple calculator so paste it right here four times so if the case was subtract so simply subtract num1 from num2 and if the case was multiply simply multiply num1 with num2 and this will be in the string and also the colon in here and also for this fourth we are going to have divide and also divide num1 by num2 so that's it now format the code and the case is addition so now when we run this we will get the output of 15 you can see we got 15 now when we change the operator to subtract and when we also change the values of num1 and num2 let's say 20 minus 10 from 20 so we will get 10 let's make it 25 so we will get the 15 answer 
and this case will be true now run this and we will get the answer of 15 so you can see we got 15 and also change it to multiply so we will get the answer of this third statement multiply 25 by 10 we got 250 so that's a really simple calculator you can also do it using if else statement like to check if the operator was equally equal to add simply add the num1 and num2 and if the operator was equal equal to minus simply minus the number one from number two so that's how you can use switch statements in the dot programming language and the switch statements compare integers and string instead of booleans like the if else conditional statement so now it's time to go for loops so the loops are used whenever we want some certain instructions to repeat and in dart programming language we have the loops of for loop while loop and do while loop so we have these three kinds of loops in our dart programming language so first of all the for loop the for loop is the loop which executes the block of code for a specified number of times and the syntax of for loop is first we have to specify the for keyword and then inside this we are going to have a variable of type int and then we are going to have a condition check and then we are going to have an counter or incrementer of that i variable and then we are going to have a body of that loop where we will do something so that's the syntax of our for loop and now this loop will run five times just because we have specified the i value equal to zero and whenever this loop is less than five so anytime this will increment this using this counter and will run this loop five times so now we will print inside this print hello and run this code and we will get this hello five times and in the console when we run this code you can see we got the hello five times so as i said the for loop is a loop which execute a block of code for a specified number of times so we execute our hello print statement five times and next we have the same for loop but in this we will use the in keyword that will be for loop and used in keyword in here so this for in loop is used when you want to iterate over an list or an array in some other programming languages like let's suppose we have the list of numbers equal to from 10 20 30 40 and 50 we got this list of numbers and when we want to iterate this list of numbers we will do for number in numbers and print the number so we have iterate over this array and its type will be int number so that's it now we have iterate over this array and let's comment this for loop and run this code so we will get these values just like in this sequence so we got 10 20 30 40 and 50 one by one so that's how we iterate over on list or in arrays in other programming languages using for loops and this in keywords so what we are doing in here we are saying a single number in numbers so this for loop will execute according to the elements in this list so we have the five elements in this list so this loop execute five times and each time it give us the single number from this list so that's how using for loop we can iterate over a list and you will get to know more about these for loop in the future videos when we go for real app development and here comes the real scenarios of iterating over a list of documents in our firebase firestore and some other database just like this so you will get to know more about this in the future videos so one of the common example of for loop can also be like let's comment this out and suppose we want to print a table like let's say we have an int variable and the number is equal to 6 like we want to print the table of 6 so for that we can use the for loop like first we will say for int i equal to 0 
first we have i equal to 0 or let's say this will start from 1 so we will set the i equal to 1 and then here we will check if the i is less than 11 so from 1 to 11 is 10 and we will increment this i and in the body of for loop we will print first of all we will print that number 10 times and this will be like this number so that will be our number 6 each time here it will comes and here we will do x means multiply and here we will do i means the number which will increment each time when the loop runs like first this will be 1 and next time this will be 2 and next time this will be 3rd and after this this will be 4 so each time this loop runs this will execute this will increment the i one time and here will comes like 1 2 3 4 5 and till 10 and next we are going to have an equal to and here we will multiply the number with i each time we will multiply this six number with the number which increments over the time when the loop runs like when you run this code and look at the output so each time we are getting 6 just because we have specified the 6 in here so that's the number we are getting in here and the i is the number which increments over the time when the loop runs you can see first the i was 1 then the i was 2 3 4 5 6 7 and till 10 and first of all we got the number multiplied with the 1 i first of all the i was 1 so it multiply by 1 so when 6 number multiply by 1 first time so we got the answer of 6 and next time when the loop runs so the number was still 6 and when this multiply by 2 so this time this multiply by 2 just because this was the second time of the loop so we got the 12 and third time when the loop runs so the i becomes 3 and here the number 6 multiplied by 3 so we got the 18 answer and just like this at the fourth time the 6 multiplied by 4 and we got 24 and then with 5 we got 30 and with 6 we got 36 and so on and like this we can print some other table like when you put 7 in here and run this so we will get the table of 7 like this so that was one of the common example of using for loop and printing and table just like this and one more thing here we can do if you comment this out also and uncomment this first for loop here we have the statements of break and continue the break statement is already used in the switch statement from the previous topic of switch like break or terminate the switch to stop the other checks and just return the value which already has in the particular switch statement on which the condition satisfied so here we can also do inside the for loop we can check if the loops runs three times and we got the i equal to three so when the i becomes three simply print sorry and break or terminate the loop so first the loop will start from zero and three times it will print hello and then when the i becomes equal to three this will print one sorry and will terminate the loops and this will not print two more hellos as we have specified five in here so now run this loop to check this out so we got three times hello just because it start from zero we got one hello from one we got second hello and from two we got third hello and when the i becomes equal to three we got the sorry and the loops terminate and then nothing executes and the loops end so that's how this break statement works and the continue statement works like just to skip that particular number which we have specified in the else condition in the f condition and simply print the other one so now when i run this so this give us first three hellos like from 0 1 2 and when this become equal to 3 this give us 0 and continues and give us the next hello which was remaining and that was also it for this continuous statement that continue is used for just to skip that number which we have specified in the if condition so that was also for break and continue and you will get to know more about this in more details 
when you go for real app development of Flutter. So that was it. Now let's remove all of this code for for loop in here and start working with while loop. So first of all, the while loops runs until and unless the specified condition is true. Like let's suppose we have an int variable of num equal to 5 and here we have the keyword of while and here we will check while 5 is less than 10. So or let's make it more precise make it 0 and make it num and make this 5 and we got the 0 value in the num or let's make it num1 so we got this num1 in here having the value of 0 we are checking while the num1 value is less than 5 so you have to simply print the dart and simply increment the num1 each time when the loop ends so this loop will also run 5 times and when the num becomes equal to 5 so the loop will terminate and this will print the dart 5 times so now run this code and we will get the dart 5 times so you can see we got this dart 5 times but when you forget this num1 and do not increment this just like this so you will loop will becomes an infinity state and will never be ended and this can also freeze your system and then you have to restart your IDE or in the dart pad you have to restart this browser so while using while loops not forget to increment or decrement at the end so that was the while loop until and unless this condition is not satisfied so the body will we executed that times which we have specified in here and the do while loop is really simple what it does is first it executes the code and then it checks for this condition like let's remove this or let's not remove this like let's do the do and open body and cut this body from this file and paste it right here now also remove the body from this file and cut this and paste it right here and also put the semicolon in here and now format this code so what it do is first it do and perform this work and while this condition is true now when we run this code so the output will be similar as we had for the while so that's how while and do while works and that was the basic concepts of for loop while loop and do while loop so that was it also for the basic concepts of loops in the Dart programming language and you will get to know more about these in the future videos when you go for real app development. And next in our Dart programming language we have the concepts of functions. The functions is a set of code that together perform a specific task. The functions are used to break large number of code into small pieces of code and reuse it when needed. And to perform a specific task on a function, a function need to be called. So the syntax of the function will be something like this. First we are going to have the return type of the function and then we are going to have the function name and then the parentheses and then if it accept parameters or not and then simply return some value from it and that's the body curly braces of the function. So now the main is also our entry point function which executes our dart code. So outside this main function we will create another function its return type will be first of all let's say int and its name will be sum of numbers and it is going to accept the parameters of int num1 and int num2 and open body and this is going to return the num1 plus num2 so that's an function which return type is int meaning that it will returns the integer value and the name of the function is the sum of number it accept num1 and num2 and simply in the return it returns the sum of these two numbers and now when we remove this comment statement from here and run this code so we will get nothing in the console just because as i said to perform a specific task on function a function must be called so we will call our 
sum of numbers function in our main function so it will be executed and will give us the result in our console so in the main function we will do sum of function or not function but numbers and that's it now here there will be an error in the error you can see in the line 3 two positional argument accepted but found zero so it means we have to also pass integer first value and the second value so that will return the addition or the sum of these values so let's pass 5 and 5 so now when we run this so we will still get nothing in the console just because we have called this function but we are not printing it somewhere to to display it in our console so we will do int result equal to sum of numbers so we store so we store our two numbers sum in the result function which is also of type int and then we will print this result and when we run this now we will get the sum of these two numbers that will be 10 so now the sum of numbers function perform a specific task that is to return the sum of these two numbers and now whenever we need the sum of two numbers somewhere else in our code so we don't have to write every time like we are going to have two variables and then add them and then when we need them in the other module so we have to copy them and paste them in here and then if we need it in the other module so we will copy that and paste them in the other module so in order to avoid this repetition of code we are going to have a single sum of numbers function and whenever we need the sum of two numbers we will simply call that function and simply pass the values and print or return the result that we needed so that's how it breaks large number of code into small pieces and reuse it whenever it's needed so that's the function which returns the sum of two numbers so we also can have the function of int calculator so this is our simple calculator which is going to accept three parameters that will be of type first will be int num1 and the second will be int num2 and the third will be string operator now open body here we will check or we can also use the switch statement but that we have used in the switch statement so now let's also try it using the if condition so we will do if the operator was equal equal to addition so what you have to do simply return the num1 plus num2 and else if if the operator was equal equal to minus simply what you have to do return num1 minus num2 and in the else if we will do if the operator was equal equal to multiply so what you have to do simply return the num1 multiplied by num2 and in the else if we will do if the operator was equal equal to divide simply return num1 divided by num2 and in the else condition if none of these operator has match we will simply return 0 and we can also reduce our work by changing the return type of this calculator to void meaning that it will return nothing so instead of return we will simply print directly the num1 and num2 addition print this and also copy this and paste it right here and also in here and also in here and also for the else condition now only change the signs minus multiply divide and if none of these condition has matched we will say invalid operator that's it now copy this calculator name and simply paste it right here and simply pass the values now three positional arguments are required so our num1 is going to be let's say 5 and 5 and operator will be let's say multiply so 5 multiply by 5 and when we run this so this will 
give us the output now this time we don't have to store it in the result or some other variable just because we have the void type means nothing and we simply print this just like this now run this code so we will get the output 5 multiply 5 25 so we got 10 the result of this sum of two numbers and 25 by multiplying 5 multiplied by 5 and that specific calculation is performed in this calculator function now this is our calculator functions which only perform the calculation of addition subtraction multiplication division and these calculations of now let's divide 30 on 5 so this will give us the output of 6 and that's it now when we pass some other operator in here like hash that is not operator now when we run this so now the else condition will set invalid operator and that's how this calculator works and that was it for functions to break our large number of code into small pieces and reuse it whenever it is required in some module so that was also it for the functions of dot programming language and you will get to know more about this in detail in the future videos so we talked about dot collections in the starting of the video and in the section of data types but that was not it for the collections the collections are really important concepts that every developer must know more about them so let's explore dart collections a bit more in depth so up until now we have talked about only two collections that were list and map but now we are going to talk about one more collection of dart programming language that is set and you will get to know about it in a while so first let's explore the list collection of dart programming language so let's create a list so we got a list of numbers and now list has some properties and some methods first we are going to explore the properties of list the first property of list is numbers dot first to get the first element from the list so now run this code to see the output of this program so in the console you can see we got one output just because we have done numbers dot first we use the property of list which returns the list first element and list has some other properties and the other property of the list is numbers dot length to check the size of the length by default the indices or the index of the list starts from zero like this element index is 0 and this element index is 1 this is 2 3 and 4 just like this but the length returns the size of a list so now run this so this will give us 5 just because we have only 5 elements in the list you can see we got 1 the first element of the list from this first property and from the length we got the 5 the length or the size of the list and we have one more property of list that is numbers dot last to get the last element of the list now run this so we will get the 5 again just because that's the last element of the list and we have some other properties of list like this the numbers dot reverse this will give us all the numbers in reverse order like first 5 4 3 2 and 1 and these are the properties of list is empty and is not empty to check the condition on list if the list is empty do something else if it's not empty do something else so you have learned about the if else condition statements so you might apply these statements or properties of list on the list like we can check the condition in here if the numbers dot is empty if the list was empty the numbers list is empty so what you have to do print list is empty and in the else condition if it was not empty simply print list is not empty so for now let's comment it out and also these properties to check only first these properties and then we will go for this condition so now first also comment out this to only check this reverse so now run this so we will get all the elements of this number in the reverse order so we got 5 4 3 2 and 1 so that's how this reverse property of the list works now let's comment this out and uncomment this is empty so this will give us the output of false just because our numbers list is not empty run this and we will get false 
you can see it in here but when we remove the elements from the list and again run this so we will get true just because now list is empty you can see here we got true now ctrl z to undo and also comment this property now uncomment this property and run this so this output will also be true just because the list is not empty you can see we got and now when we remove the elements from the list and run it again so this will give us false just because now the list is empty and we are saying list is not empty so that's how these two properties works now also comment this out and uncomment this if condition now run this so this will print list is empty just because we have checked the condition if it was empty so simply print this otherwise this so the list is empty so it is saying list is empty and if it was not empty like one two three four and five now run this so you will get the else condition satisfied list is not empty you can see it in here so that was some properties of list and now let's talk about the methods of list but before this let me show you one more thing by removing or commenting these properties from here and in here i can update the list on the particular index like i can say the numbers on index 2 make it equal to 10 and now print the numbers and also make it numbers so what we are doing in here we are setting on the index to put the 10 element or that will become the element on the index 2 now when we run this so 0 1 2 in the place of 3 we will get 10 you can see we got 1 2 and there was 3 so we got 10 just because we have just updated the list on the index 2 and we put the number or element 10 in here so like this we can also update like numbers on index 4 make it equal to 20 so the index 4 we have is 0 1 2 3 and 4 so means on the place of 5 just put this 20 now run this so we will get 20 in here you can see we got 20 but in case if you do on the 6 index and again run this so this will say the range error just because we don't have the index 6 in here we have only 4 indexes starting from 0 to 4 so that's how you can update the list on the index and now let's talk about the list methods so let's have some methods like let's comment this out also and cut this from here and paste it right here and now list has some methods the first method of list is numbers dot add so add and here it will say if you call this method on this numbers mean list so it will say error positional argument expected but found zero so it means we have to pass some element to add this in the numbers list so let's say we pass 20 so this element will be added at the 5 index like right after this 5 and this 5 is on the index 4 now run this so we will get 20 after this 5 you can see it in here and now we can modify this like this like numbers on index 5 make it 10 so first we add 20 and then after this we make it 10 and then we will print it so we, when we run this so we will get 10 instead of 20 so that's it we add it and then we update it then we print it so now let's remove this update and that was the first method of list and the next method is let's comment this out the next method of list is add all and it is saying again one positional argument expected but found zero so add all except the list of numbers or any type that you want to add in the numbers so you have to put the large brackets and inside this you have to put like 6 6 7 8 9 and 10 now when we run this so we will get all these elements right after this 5 so you can see we had only 5 and we got 10 like if i print the numbers in here and now run this so first when the add all method has not been called so we had only the five elements in the list and now when we call the add all and 
add all these list of numbers in this numbers and then when you print it so we got six seven eight nine ten also after also in that numbers list so that was the second method of list to add all or add the list of numbers or any type that you want to add like if i also want to add some string in here and say apple and also want to add some true false and 4.5 etc and now run this so we will get also these in these numbers list and when this executes and gives the output of all of these data in the list so that's how this add all works and also this add now also let's comment this out and let's move to the second method of list so the second method of list is the remove method it also required one positional arguments and we will pass four now let's run this and we will get the output of 1 2 3 4 5 and this remove the for element from here the element we want to remove from the list so simply we have to pass that element so this will remove that element from the list but in case we pass the element 10 and the 10 element is not exist in the number list so when we run this so this will give us the same list which we have the numbers but this execute or this function do not work just because the 10 element is not in the list but when we uncomment this and now run this so now after coming to this remove method first we got the number list when we print it first time we will get these five elements list and then we add this data in the list and now it has 10 so it removed 10 and then it will give us the numbers in here so when these numbers are print on this print statement so there will there will not be the 10 element just because we have just removed it using this removes method so now run this and we will get first the numbers 5 and you can see we got all the numbers we have added in here except the 10 so just because we just removed after adding it in the list so that's how this remove method of the list works so now next method of the list is remove at so now let's comment these two methods from here and next method is numbers dot remove at so this method will remove the particular element on the specific index like i want to remove an element on the specific index that is zero so on zero index we have one element so first it will print all the list and then it will remove the element on the zero index then it will print it now run this so we will get one from one to five and then from two to five just because we have just removed the element on the zero index and in case if you do seven and the seven index is not in here so definitely this will throw again the range error just because we are removing the element on the index that index does not exist or not in here and it is something like the exception out of bond or the range error and with this we have one more method of list that is numbers dot remove last to remove the last element of the list and it do not require any element just because this will directly remove the last element you can see in this documentation remove and returns the last object in the list as list is an order collection of objects or we can also call these elements so now run this so we will get from one to four just because this remove last will remove the five from here so that was also it for the remove last method and here we have one more method of list that is numbers dot for each so this is also like the for loop that we have used the for in loop to iterate and list so this is called an anonymous function like the for each and inside this we have to pass an parameter let's name it element and it can be anything like only e and open body so what we are doing here we are saying from numbers list for each element print that particular element 
Now run this and we will get all the elements iterated one by one. So you can see first we got this number in here and then we got the iterated numbers one by one and then we got the list again just because of this print statement. So that's also called for each the anonymous function of list. And this element can be only E or also anything that you want to name your each element in the list. So that was also the function of or the method of the list. So that's the most basic and important concepts about list that you must know if you are dart developer so that was it for the collection list now let's talk about the dart maps a bit more in depth a map is an object that store data in the form of key and value pairs and same like the list the map has some properties and some functions so now let's remove these list data from here and now it's time to go for this map so first let's create the variable of a map map and name it user data equals to we represent a map using curly braces put semicolon and there we are going to have key and value pairs so key will be let's say username and the username is john and his age is 25 and we separate key and value pairs using the colon and we also separate a pair of key value using comma same like the list so that is our map object having two key and value pairs so now let's talk about the properties of map the first property of map is let's say user data our variable dot keys to get all the keys of that map object <coughs> so now run this and we got username and edge the keys of that user data object and we can also do user data dot values to get only values of that user data map object so now run this and right after this username and edge you will also get the john and 25 the values of a map object and next as we had for the list we can also get the length of a map or the size of the map so user data dot length so its length is 2 just because we have only 2 key value of pairs so we got 2 in here just because we have at time only username and edge and if we had like some address new york and now run this so we will get 3 in here you can see we got 3 the key address the value new york in here and also we have the same methods like is empty and also is not empty like to check if the map is empty or not now if i print and say user data dot is empty so it will return false just because the user data object map is not empty now when i run this and we got false and if i say is not empty and simply it will say true just because the user data is not empty so that was some properties of map and now let's move to the methods of map so map has some quite similar methods as we had for the list so now let's comment these out and the first method we are going to have is user data dot add all and it accept a map object and this will add all the values inside that object in our user data map object like as we had for the list the add all method accept the whole list and for the map the user data add all accept the map object so we are going to have let's remove this data just because it's getting longer from here so we got only username in here and now we are going to add the edge and now we are going to add edge 25 and also the address new york using the add all method so we will get the same result 
but when we run this this will not give us the output just because we had to print the user data also so now run this and we will get the map object having all these values in the map we got username john h25 address new york and if we print the user data in here so the user data is going to have only one key value pair that is username john and when we use this add also we got all these methods in that user data map object also so you can see in the console we got the output as expected and that was one method of the map object so the next method is going to have user data dot clear to clear or remove everything from this map now run this first of all you will get the user data having username and john and next when you call the clear and after this when we print this user data we got the empty map so that was the second method of the map and next methods of map objects are searching methods like this was to insert data in the map object and next methods are to search a specific key or value in the map object and return some data according to that so that methods are contains key and also the contains value so we are going to check them using if else conditional statements so we will say if the user data dot contains the key of username so in the body we will do user data on username make it equals to steve so what we are doing here we are saying if the user data contains the username key simply update that key value to steve as it as we have set it john so it will update it to steve and in the else condition what you have to say to the user simply print the key you are searching for does not exist just like this now run this and the output will be you can see we got john and next we got the steve just because the username exists now let's change this username to only name so now what will be the expected output we know that this will be the else condition just because the first condition is not true the contents key is a boolean method of map whether this map contains the given key or not if it do not contains the key simply the else will be executed and its return type is boolean so it means in this case it's false just because this do not contain the username as we have changed it to only name now run this and we will get the output the key you are searching for does not exist and the data is print as same as that we have in here using this print statement again and next we have the contents value if it contains the any key value john so what you have to do simply update the username field or key to steve jobs otherwise print the same message the key you are searching for does not exist so in case the name key has the value john so it means the john exists so it will update the name this time this is going to update the name to steve jobs now run this and we will get the output name steve jobs in the this print statement as this condition was true so these are just the boolean methods of data to check if the or map object contains value or key then perform some action on that map object and now if i change this john to let's say john s the lar the capital s so now this is not the key present in here in the map object when i run this so we will get this answer and the data will be printed as same as we have in the user data object you can see we got this message and the same data as we have in here so that was it also for the contents key and contents value methods of the map object now let's also comment this out and the last method of key we are going to use is user data dot 
remove the specific key value pair and name now this will remove the specific key value pair which names is name so now run this first time it will print the object having these key value pairs and next time this will give us the empty just because we have just removed this key value pair using the name using the key we removed the key value pair and just like this now let's put the edge 25 and now run this so this will only get the edge 25 just because we removed the key value pair using the name key so that was also it for the map properties and map methods but one more thing here you can also do as we had for the list to insert some data in the map object let's comment this print statement also and in here you can also do user data on address make it equal to new york so it means it also insert one more field or one more key and value pair in the user data object so let's also print the user data in here to see before and after of this user data so let's cut this and say before and print this user data and also in here cut this and say after user data now run this so we will get the answer or the result of the before was this same and after when we use the address to new york so we also got the address inserted in the user data map object so that was also it for the map collections of dart programming language now it's time to go for set so now let's talk about the set collection of dart programming language so as we had the list collection and order collection of objects the set is quite opposite to that a set is an unordered collection of objects and with this the set does not allow storing duplicate values like every value must be unique and will not be duplicated we can declare a set like this first we have to do set and let's say set data equals to and the set is represented in the curly braces now inside this we are going to have one two three four and that's good but we can't do four again and when we print this set data and run this we will get only one two three four but this four is ignored and it is also saying two elements in a set literal should not be equal so it is saying change or remove the duplicate element and the compiler itself also ignored this for just like this and also we can store the user true false 5.5 and also 5.5 so this will also be ignored and when we do one more false in here so this will also be ignored and if we do one more user string in here so this will also be ignored and will give us only the unique one values like you can see we got from one to four and this user is ignored this is also ignored and this 5.5 or this is 5.5 and this will be ignored this time so only the unique values will be printed but the values that are duplicated should be ignored so that's how we deal with the set and if we compare it to with the list we have the list and say list data equals to we represent a list in the square brackets or large brackets one two three four and five and we can have five so many times and in if we print this list data so this will give us the same data or elements we have in the list and will not be ignored so that's the difference between list and set and now let's remove the list data from here and let's try to explore the properties and functions of set so first we are going to have the properties of list or set but before printing or doing something with the properties let's remove these duplicate data and other data from here to make this set more simple so we have the data from 1 to 5 
integer values in our set object variable. So the properties of set are quite similar to the list and map. Like we have the properties of length to check the size of the set and also we have the property of first and last to get the first and last element of the set as we had for the list and also the is empty to check if the set is empty or not and also is is not empty and that's it these are some basic properties of set the first one is to get the size first element last element check if it's empty or check if it's not empty and then we have the methods of set the first method of set is same as we had for the list set data dot add 10 so now run this so we will get the 10 also in the list you can see it in here but if you try to add 5 and run this so we will get only from 1 to 5 and the 5 will not be duplicated and this was the same method and one more method is also same as we had for the list like set data dot add all and this is going to accept as we had for the map and list the object of list and the data will be let's say 6 7 8 9 and 10 and now when we run this so we have added the list or the set object so we will get from 1 to 10 and if the we got the value duplicated like let's say we have the values of 1 2 3 also and now when we run this so we will not get these 1 2 3 again but the unique values from 1 to 10 so that was the second method of set and the third method of set is the contents to check if it contains this specific value so we will use it in the if condition we will say if the set data dot contains the 5 so what you have to do set data dot remove 5 and this remove is also a method to remove a specific element from the set as we had for the list and in the else condition if it do not contain simply print element does not exist now that's it run this so we will get from 1 to 4 just because it contains the 5 and simply it removes it and what if we do 7 in here now it will check for 7 if it contains 7 then you have to remove the 5 so it do not contain 7 so it means the first condition is false and we will get this output element does not exist and simply our data again which we have in the set data variable so we got the print statement element does not exist just because the first condition was false and we got again the our set data in here so that was also the contents method now let's comment it out and the next method of set is the difference so meaning that the difference between two sets so first we are going to change the name of this first set to first set and we are going to have the second set its name will be second set which will be equal to the set of one two three and then some other values like six seven and eight that's it now we are going to check the difference between these two sets so first set dot difference second set so it will check the difference between two sets and it will remove the similar values and will give us the first set remaining values like run this code so we got four and five it removes one two three from here and give us the first set difference that is four and five and if you do second set difference first set so now it will remove the same these values but this time this is not going to give us 4 and 5 but will give us 6 7 and 8 now run this and we got 6 7 and 8 value just because this is the set second set difference 
the first set and when you click this difference and see in the documentation what this difference method of set does it creates a new set with elements of this that are not in the other so it creates a new set of the values that does not exist in the other list so 6, 7, 8 values are not in the first list so it give us this list and remove the similar values from here and the same was for the situation if we done the first set difference second set and we got the 4 and 5 values so that was it for the difference method of set and next method of set is the method of let's say first set dot element add so this will give us the element on the specific index let's say 0 and also remove the print statement and print only first set now run this so we will get the element which is on zero index so we got the set data from one to five just because we have to do this in the print statement in here we don't have to print the first set directly so that's it now run this so we will get the first element on index remove the semicolon from here and now run this so we got one just because that is on the zero index if you do the 6 and there is not the 6 index in here 0 1 2 3 4 nor 5 neither 6 so we will get the range error in you can see it in here and if we do 3 so 0 1 2 and 3 we will get the 4 result in the console so that was also the method of set and there is one more method of set is let's comment this out and let's do first set dot for each element in the list not in the list but the set and give us that element and simply print this element so we got all the element of the set and simply print them one by one that is for each invox action on each element of the iterable in the iteration order so it will iterate on each element in the set and give and will give us one by one each element now run this and we will get each element of the set one by one so that was also one of the method of the set as we had for the list and now one of the interesting methods of set are let's do them in here first set dot union second set and also print them cut this from here and simply print paste it in here and put semicolon outside so what is union the union is to combine the values of two sets and give us only one set so these two first and second list will be combined and will give us the values of 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 and 8 now run this so we will get the combined set from 1 to 8 and these values are ignored just because that's combined and the similarities are ignored and next we have the intersection in list so we will do first set dot intersection second set inside the parenthesis of the intersection so it will give us only the similar values in the first and second list and the values that are not similar in both lists will be ignored so now run this in the second list we are going to have the from one to three values just because these are similar in both lists you can see we got this intersection and this union and one more method is that is remove at method of the set to remove a specific element on the specific index like if i pass in here the two and print it so this will remove the 0 1 2 this three element from the set so that's how this works so that was also it for the collection set of dart programming language so along with this journey we learned so many concepts of dart programming language and most importantly the collection data types list maps and sets so now don't you think we should explore them a bit more Yes, we should because we have to. Anyways, let's talk about one of the most important concepts of Dart, that is generics. Well, 
What is it generix enables stronger type checking again a question what kind of stronger type checking so by default dart collections are heterogeneous type meaning that a single dart collection can hold the values of several data types as you have seen in the previous sections of collections list maps and sets however a dart collection can also store the homogeneous or the values of the same type that's where the generix comes in the generix are the way to support type safety implementation for all dart collection and a pair of angular brackets are used to declare the type safe collection so we have this empty man method to declare a generic collection we have to do let's say list and as i said a pair of angular brackets are used to declare the type self collection or the generic collection list of string list data equals to an empty list so now this list is going to contain only the string elements not the integer double booleans etc as we had for the only list list data equals to an empty list and let's say we can store a string and also one two three and true false 2.5 etc but in case of the generic list or the type safe collection there must be only string elements in this list so we can store the elements like str1 str2 and str3 but i can't do here like 1 2 and 3 this will tell us directly in the compile time the element of type int cannot be assigned to the list type string so that's how we declare the type safe collection or a generic collection so the generics are mostly used when we want the specific data type data in one list like i only want to store the string data in this list i don't want to store the booleans doubles integers etc but i only want to store the string data in this list so simply what i have to do is to put simply this angular brackets and simply put the type of the values that i want to store like if i change this type to int so we will get the compile time error now it will say the element of type string cannot be assigned to the list type integer so now i have to change this str123 to 1 2 and 3 and 4 5 etc to overcome this error so that's how we make our collections generic so that was only for list now also for the sets like sets and set of type double and its name will be set data equals to So now this is not going to store the data of string or boolean like this but instead it is going to store the data like 2.5 4.5 9.9 just like this and also for the map as map has key and value pairs so we will do for the map map and the key of the map will be string and the value can be dynamic or also you can specify the only string so this map string dynamic is the json type like the key and value pairs if you're familiar with the json these are the key and value pairs and you can also do the map string and string also and this first is key and the second is value so now let's name our map the map data equals to and now our key will be string list and name and our value of the key can be of any type like 2.5 true and also false and also the string like john and anything just because the value is dynamic and also let's say age 5 So that's how we declare the generic collections in our dart programming language. And if I want to add some data in this list of int, let's say list list data dart add and I want to add some data as a string like str. 
so we will get the error just because we are adding the data in the list data which is type safe which is int which you can only store the integer data types and i am adding the data of type string you can see we are getting again the compile time error the argument of type string cannot be assigned to the parameter type int so we also cannot specify or add any data in the type safe collections so that was the generics of dot or the type safe collections and you will get to know more about these in the future videos so that was it for the dart generics or type safe collections now we are going to talk about one of the most important concepts of dart programming language that is exception handling so you may be heard about the terms that are exception and also the error so what are they first we are going to discuss about the exception and then we will go for discussing the error exception an exception should be thrown for regular expected flow and is intended to be caught. Meaning that we can know about the flow that it can throw an exception and we can also catch that particular exception. To understand it more clearly, let's suppose the authentication of the user in an application. So we know that if user pass wrong email or username. So it's the possible exception that in this case we can say the user not found on this email or username so in this authentication case we knew that the user can pass wrong email or username so then we can throw some exception to tell the user that user not found on that email or username so that was the exception which can be caught and also expected in some function that are performing some specific task as we have talked about the authentication of user and on the other hand an error is a, and on the other hand the error should be thrown for unexpected program flow and should not be caught but it's addressed by the programmer like suppose you assert something and say this variable cannot have this value but still if you pass it so this will be an error or assertion fail error and some other error can be like if you pass some wrong value and this will be the error so that was a bit theory now let's understand it by doing it practically so dot provide us the try catch to handle some exceptions in our code and with this we have the finally which is some body which executes right after the try catch block so you will also get to know about this and next we have the on clause meaning that if an exception is expected that if we know that particular exception can be thrown so we can use the on clause so how we can use it you will get to know about this in a while so first of all let's suppose a program suppose we have a function of type integer and its name is kit user edge and it accepts one parameter of type integer and its name is edge and then in the body of that function we are checking if the edge was less than zero so throw an exception and pass this string wrong this throw keyword is used to throw some exception and this exception is a marker interface implemented by all the exceptions in the core library like the format exception io exception timeout exception etc so i set the marker interface to the exception so what is an interface you will get to know about this when you go for the object oriented programming concept so for now let's keep it like this and in the else condition of this function what we are doing simply returning the edge if it was greater than zero so now if we click this exception we got the documentation the exception is an interface or an abstract class which has a dynamic message in its constructor and you can also read it more about this exception by going to the open library docs so this was the function now we will call this function in our main function to execute it and get the answer so in here we will use the try catch block to handle this exception in case if the edge was less than zero so we will use try catch block so we will say try try the get user edge and pass some edge let's say five and that's it and in the catch block 
catch some exception if exist we will name our exception only e and also open body for this as we have for the try and here we will print edge must be greater than zero and also print this e which will be this dynamic message passed in the constructor parenthesis of this exception so in here we have passed the five meaning that this first condition is not true so we will get simply the answer edge returned by this function so when we run this we will get nothing just because we are simply returning it but not printing it so to print it we will simply store this get user edge in the variable of type int and we will name it result and then we will print this result that's it now run this code so we will get the edge 5 and that was the expected answer but in case if we pass some edge which is less than 0 means minus 2 so now when we run this we will get the exception edge must be greater than 0 exception wrong so that was our exception and was in the expected flow that it was expected that it can happen so if it can happen so it means we can also catch this exception so that was one example of exception and the second example of this exception can be let's suppose we have this function its return type is double meaning that it will return the decimal value its name is divide two numbers and it accepts two parameters num1 and num2 inside the body of this function we are checking if the num2 was equal equal to zero meaning that if num1 divided by zero so we will throw the integer division by zero exception and in the else condition if the num2 was not equal to zero simply we will return the division answer of 1 divided by 2 or the num1 divided by num2 so that's what this function does so now we will comment out the first try block the first try catch block in our main and then we will do for this divide two numbers or let's say instead of commenting them out let's remove these values from here and call the values of divided by 2 num function so here we will do double result equals to divide two nums meaning that this function and then we have to pass the num1 and num2 so let's say we pass 50 and 5 and in the catch what we will do simply print cannot divide on zero and also print this e and with this also print this result so now in this divide two nums the first condition is false meaning that the num2 is not equal equal to zero and in the else condition this condition is true so it will divide 50 by 5 and we will get the answer 10 now let's run this and check what is the answer so we got 10 50 divided by 5 but in case if we got the num2 zero so what will be the expected exception this will be our integer division by zero exception now run this so we will get this exception you can see we got cannot divide it on zero integer division by zero exception so that was for our exception handling try catch block and then we have the finally the finally executes right after the try and catch block so as we have for try and catch so right after this catch body where the catch body in so we can pass here the finally and open the body for it and we can print in here finally the handling of exception ints so that's it run this so after the exception printed we will get the finally also so that's just the finally which executes right after this try and catch and next we have the on clause this on clause is used when we are sure about the exception that what exception can be thrown from an expected 
from end function so let's suppose let's remove this finally and here let's also remove this catch block from here we can say on integer divided by zero we are saying try some value on this exception catch the sam e and simply print cannot divide on zero that's it now run this so we will get the integer division by zero exception in here let's hide it and you can see if we got this exception in here so that was also for the on clause and the example of error will be like let's suppose we have a variable in our man so we have this variable which value is not used so right after this variable we can assert that the name is not equal to john so we are asserting the name variable should not be john and right after this we print hello name meaning that hello john so let's comment this out and try only this assertion error so run this so we will get the assertion error assertion fail meaning that the name should not be equal to john so that's the assertion fail error and also one other example of error will be let's suppose we pass the string instead of string now open this you can see we got the error so that's the error undefined class string so that's our or the programmers mistake so that we have to correct but we cannot catch this error just because that's the error that's the programmers mistake so programmers have to correct it by changing the code so make it string and this assertion change it to steve so when we run this we will get the answer hello steve instead of getting the assertion failed error so that was the difference between exception and also the error and also some examples from these errors and the exceptions and one more thing here is the warning the integer division by zero exception is deprecated and should not be used use the unsupported error instead okay if you are saying it's deprecated so we will use the unsupported error unsupported error so this will be the same just because this class was deprecated in the previous versions of dart so no problem we can use this unsupported error so its work is same that's it and here instead of this integer division by zero we can also use this so that was it for the exception and the error so far we learned so many basics and some little advanced concepts of dart programming language but now it's time to get to know more about dart advanced concepts so we know that dart is a general purpose client optimized optionally type language to build fast app on almost every platform but with this dart is also object oriented programming language and supports all object oriented programming concepts like object and classes inheritance makes sense polymorphism encapsulation and also abstraction and we are going to learn all of these concepts in this section of object oriented programming the concepts like inheritance polymorphism encapsulation and abstractions are applied on classes so before going towards these concepts you should know about object and classes so first let's understand a bit from the theory and then we will land on the practical work so your confusions will be cleared along the way in simple words the class is a way of organizing information about some type of data so that a programmer can reuse the organized information using the same instance of the class like suppose we have a bunch of data that could be used throughout the app so what you think we should copy and paste the same data in different modules no that's not the way to do it object oriented programming solves this problem by giving us the classes for organizing that bunch of data in a container like class and reuse that data anywhere in your app using the same instance of that particular class object oriented programming also says the classes are blueprints for creating objects and as i said a class encapsulates a bunch of organized information now to access this information or the properties of the class we must create an object of the class so now what is an object an object in object oriented programming is a variable or the instance of the class used to access the properties 
of the class. These properties can be like the variables and functions inside a particular class. So next object have two features stat and behavior. Let's take a real life example. Suppose a human as an object. The state of human are like his age, name, health, etc. And the behaviors are like walking, sleeping and running. Same like this, dot object oriented programming objects has same state and behaviors. The variables inside the class are said to be the states of the class. While on the other hand, the methods that utilize these variables on some way to perform some actions are the behaviors of the object. Well, I know on the first try. Everything seems to be difficult. So I would say if you're still confused about object and classes theory, rewrite this object oriented programming section and I hope this will clear your confusions because again, nothing can be understood on its very first time. So that was it for the theory. Let's go to the practical work. So in our Dart programming language, a class can be declared using the class keyword. And then we are going to have the class name in front of the class as an identifier. Like let's suppose we named our class a person just like that. Now there is still one error. A class declaration must have a body even if it's empty. So we are going to have a body of a class. The same body as we have in here for the main method. So the body will be the curly braces open and close brackets. So we got our class in our Dart programming language. So that's how we declare our class. Now initially there is no properties inside the class like the variables and the function. Now first let's understand how we can create the object of this class. So as I said the object of a dart is a variable or the instance of the class. So inside the main method we are going to have an object of the class. So this will be a simple variable and its type will be person and we will say object or bj equals to person and simply put the parenthesis here and the semicolon. So we have created the object for this person class. Now we can access the properties inside the class using the object and using the dot notation like object dot and some property of the class. So we don't have any properties inside the class like the fields and the methods. So inside the class we are going to have some members of the class. So let's remove it and let's see what will be the members of the class. So then we will access it using this object of the class. First of all, we are going to have the fields inside the class. So what are fields? The variables inside the class is known as fields. So let's suppose we have the string variable and its name and is equal to let's say Steve and put the semicolon in here. So this variable is said to be field inside a single class. So next we can have the int integer type variable and simply h equals to let's say 30. So these are the fields inside the class. So now we can access these properties or the fields using the object of the class like we have this object inside the main function and we can access the fields like obj dot name or edge. So by doing this we have access the name property or the field of the class. Now when we run this obviously we will get nothing just because we have to wrap this object name with the print statement. Let's say print and cut this object name from here and paste it inside the parentheses of the print function and remove this column from here and put it in here. Now remove the unused spaces in here. Now run this we will get the Steve inside our console. So that's how we can create the fields inside the class and using the object of the class we can access it and these are said to be also the stats of the class. And next inside the class we can have the getters and setters. So what are getters and setters? The getter and setters allows a program to initialize and retrieve the values of fields in a class. Like let's say we have this name but is not initialized. So now this will give us an error just because by default the variables are non-nullable in Dart programming language. Dart offers sound null safety meaning that the value of the variable cannot be null unless you said that it can be. Now 
the variable are by default non-nullable but when i put the question mark in front of the uh, type of the variable so it becomes nullable and the error is gone so now we said that the variable is null so it's null by default the variable is non-nullable and we will get the error. compile time error you can see non-nullable instance field name must be initialized and on its alternative we can also use the keyword let so it also means this will be initialized later so now in the main function we can do like cut this from here and create a variable of string and name it name equals to object dot name equal to let's say john so we have initialized this and print this name and run this so we got john in here or we can also do this like remove this name from here and we have initialized this variable and simply directly print this object name now run this we will get the same answer john so that's what it is let or null safety means in dark programming language. So we are talking about the getters and setters. So first let's suppose this variable is not initialized. Let's comment this out also. And the getters and setters are as I said allow a program to initialize and retrieve the values of fields in a class. First of all we are going to have the getter method. As the variable type is string so the getter of the name to get the name will also be string like string get this is a keyword to use as a getter and then there will be the name of the getter let's say get name and simply open the body using these curly braces and return the name so that's what this getter method is doing simply using the get keyword to get it and this is a getter and simply return that name and the setter will be a bit different set means simply set a variable as it's not initialized simply declared using the let keyword meaning that it will be initialized later so the setter method will be like void set and let's say set name and this is going to accept a parameter and will be string name and inside the body we are going to do this dot name equal to name so what this means this keyword in dart programming language refers to the current instance of the class like we are saying this name of which is the field of the class will be equal to the name we pass when we call this set name so let's try it out in here so now as this name is not initialized and we run this we will get nothing in the console and it's saying let initialization error field name has not been initialized so you can see we have not initialized this variable and simply declare it using this let keyword so for that we have created the getter and setter methods get name and also set name so first of all we are going to use the set name to set that variable and then we will use this get to get that name simply right after this object name equal to john as we have initialized in here so first of all we are going to have the object dot set name and we will make it equal to let's say again the john or let's say steve jobs and simply put the semicolon in here and inside the print statement we will call the object dot get name so simply we have set the name using the setter and simply get this inside the print statement so we will get the steve jobs in our console so you can see we got the steve jobs we use the setter and then we call the get name inside the print so we got this get the value which we have set it in here and that's the value of this variable now we are not getting the let initialization error just because we have initialized this in the main method using this getters and setters so that's how we can use the getters and setters and you can also do it for also for the edge if you remove the value of it and simply initialize it using the let keyword or also you can make it nullable so you can use the get and set this on methods and simply inside the main function you can set or get these variables so now if you look at at the right hand side we have some warnings in here it says name non-constant identifiers using the lower camel case so it's talking about these names of getters and setter it's saying use the 
Lower camel case. So what are the cases or the conventions of naming the variables or some functions? So we will talk about these cases in some other video. So now let's do the lower camel cases. Let's say get and name to name the variable just like this. You can see now the warning has gone and we can name this set name. Now also change it in the main function. So the error will be gone just like this way and there is one more warning avoid return types on setter okay let's remove this also and that is set method now run this this is working the same and yes that's working the same so that was the getters and setters and the fields inside the class and we also learned the object to object to access the properties or the members inside the class using this object and next in the classes we have the constructor a constructor is a special function of the class which is created with the same name of the class like we can do on top of the fields or everything we are going to have the person and the parentheses and that's it so that's how we can create a constructor in a class so as i said a constructor is a special function so it can also be parameterized meaning that it can accept the parameters or it will be declared right after these fields but not on the top so i said a constructor is a special function so it can be parameterized mean can accept the parameters but if we declare a constructor with no parameters so a default no argument constructor is provided as we have in here no arguments are required in this constructor and the constructor is responsible for initializing the variables of the class like we can also do the same thing as we have done with the getters and setter like if i do this dot name inside the constructor of the class so you can see we got a compile time error the positional argument accepted one but found zero now let's remove these from here and also remove this object get name from here and simply pass the string let's say jobs in here and simply print the object dot name so now run this so we will get the same jobs in the console you can see in here so the constructor is responsible for initializing the variable of the class but the constructor do not have any explicit type like the regular functions we have learned the regular functions had the return type like we learn about the functions let's create a function in here like we had a function to get the sum of two numbers so we had the type of int and it name was sum and then do perform sum here and it was accepting some parameters like num1 and num2 so that was the syntax of function its explicit return type was the int but in case of the constructor is a special function or method in the class but it do not have any explicit type and is responsible for initializing the variables of a class and you will get to know more about this in more detail in the future videos if you go for real app development in flutter and next inside the class we are going to have the methods the methods or function like let's say we have a function same like the getters and setters but these are the helper functions and the functions i'm going to create are the regular function but inside the class these are also called the methods or the members of the class like let's say we have a function of int and its name is or oh, let's return type will be string and bio to return the bio of this person who is the person and this is going to return the hello my name is name which is the name and simply will say i am age years old so that's what this bio function is going to do so now in the main method we can access this main function or the bio function using the object of this person class so the object dot not age but the bio so that's how we access the function and also store it inside the variable let's say the its return type is let's say variable and let's say bio of person and make it equal to just like this and also instead of printing this we will print the bio of the person now 
when we run this she will get the hello my name is jobs and i am 30 years old you can see we got this in here hello my name is jobs the name we have specified in here we initialize the variable using the constructor like this and we got the edge from here it's it's already initialized in the class so we got this in here so we can also have some more methods in the person or in some other class just like this and we can also access them using the object of the class so we learn about the fields of the class the getters and setters the constructor to initialize the variables and also the functions inside the class and we can and we also learned about the object it has stats and behaviors the stat are these fields and the behaviors are like the bio like we have the stat name and edge and using the these variables the stat of the object the function is performing some specific task and saying hello my name is name it is using this name and my name and my edge is edge which is this edge we have stored in this edge variable so we learn all of these concepts of object oriented programming language of dart so that was it for the object and classes and dart object oriented programming language now on the next step we have the inheritance concept of object oriented programming so what is inheritance in real life the inheritance is the process by which the genetic information is passed on from parents to child like your face looks like your parents or your habits are the same as your parents etc but on the other hand in programming the inheritance is the process of deriving the properties and characteristics of another class like let's take an example and suppose we have the class a and b and class a can perform some specific task now we want class b to perform the same task as the a class so we will derive the class b from the class a so by doing this we will be able to use the properties of a class in the b class so now let's understand it by doing it practically in the online editor dot pad suppose we have these two classes class a and b the class a has some properties or the fields of name steve and age 45 so we can create the object for a and can access the properties of name and age but we want these similar properties inside the b class so for that we have to derive b class from a class so to derive b class from a class dart provide us the extent keyword to do this so we will use the extends keyword right after this b class name we will do extends and in front of it we will say the a so now b class extends a meaning that b is derived from a class now the class a is said to be the super class or the parent class and the class B is said to be the child class or the subclass. Like the A class becomes its parent and the B becomes its child or superclass A and subclass B. Now if we create an object for B, let's say B and let's say object B and make it equal to B and put parentheses to initialize or instantiate the class. So we got object B. Now we will print and say object b dot name so you can see we don't have any name properties inside the b and we create the object of b simply the b is derived from a that's because we have these properties also in the b class now when we run this we will get the steve in our console so that's how we can derive one class from other class to get the characteristic and some properties of one class in the other class so that was some basic i wanted you to know and next we have the types of inheritance the types are let's write or comment it out in here we have first type single inheritance which we have already performed in here let i will explain it in a while first let me write it in here the single inheritance and next we have multiple inheritance multi-level inheritance hierarchical inheritance so we have these four types of inheritance and we already have performed the single inheritance meaning that only one class derive the other class and there is no third class in here so it means this is single inheritance in dart programming language but in case of multiple inheritance so dart do not support multiple inheritance like to extends 
one class from so many classes and it is supported in other programming languages like C++ and some other. So on the third number, we have the multi-level inheritance. So what is multi-level inheritance? Multi-level inheritance will be if A class is inherited by or derived by B class and then B class is inherited or derived by C class and making the chain of classes so that will be called multi-level inheritance like we have the A and B classes and then we create one more class and name it C and the C extends B class and open body and now when we create D class and D class and D class extends C class so that will be multi-level inheritance and now we can have these similar properties also in the C class just because first B extends A class so I got these classes now when we now when C extends B class so we already have these properties so C will also got these properties now let's try it out let's create one more instance or object C and name it object C equal to C and instantiate now when we print and simply do object C dot name you can see we can x the name also from the c even c is on third number first b extend a and then c extend b so that's how we got the properties of a in the c using the multi-level inheritance of dot programming language so now when we run this we will get two steves in the console so that was expected now to make it more clear we will cut this and we will say belongs b equal to this and also copy this and paste it in here and name it belong c and object and this will be access from object c so when we run this we will get the thieves in the console and this belongs from b this belongs from c so that is multi-level inheritance in Dart programming language. So now what is hierarchical inheritance? Hierarchical inheritance is like if one class is extended by two classes. Like let's say we are not extending the C from B but we extend C from A. So now two classes extends one class so that is said to be hierarchical inheritance. Now the C still can have the name and edge property just because as B has the properties B extend A so just like the C also extend A so both have the same properties and these can also access the methods like if we create one method A is let's say string and eat and open body and print we will do name is eating and his edge is edge so that's the eat method inside the a and we got the compile time error just because we are setting the return type string and by default the body might completely normally causing null to be returned but the return type string is potentially non-nullable it means if we specify the explicit type to a function and this type is potentially non-nullable so it means we have to return something so this error will be gone so if we don't return something from here we will simply make it void and the error will be gone so that's just the void method means return nothing simply printing this stuff and we got this eat method in here now this eat class can be accessed from b class and also from c class just because b extend a and c also extend a and is hierarchical inheritance so in here if we do let's say object c dot eat just like this and run it so we will get the steve is eating and his edge is 45 you can see we got it in here and is belongs to object c we directly call it in here just because we are already printing it in here so we don't have to write print again and just because we are doing it like this and not putting it inside the print parenthesis so we learn about the object and classes and also the getters and setter methods the constructor and the methods and now we also learn the inheritance between the 
classes and we learn the types of inheritance single inheritance multiple inheritance is not supported in dart programming language and we learn the multi-level inheritance and also the hierarchical inheritance and this was some basic way to perform inheritance just to understand the basic you will get to know more about this or will understand it really when you go for real app development and start creating the real-time apps so this will become more clear to you when you go for the real app development so for now you should only know this that what is inheritance and what are these types of inheritance and how this works when we extend one from when you extend one class from other and how it exists the properties and the characteristic of other classes so that's all you need to know about inheritance of object oriented programming so that was it also for inheritance of object oriented programming we learn object and classes and also their methods, fields, constructors inside the classes. And we also learn inheritance with its types. And now we are going to learn the concept of polymorphism. And along with this, we have some more concepts in object oriented programming that are encapsulation, abstraction, mixins in dark programming language and that's all and so far we have learned about these two concepts how we can create objects of classes creating instances and also the classes which are like containers and contain the organized information and whenever we want to access that particular information we just have to create the instance of that particular class and there we go we got all the data inside the one container like class and next we have the inheritance which we have talked about right now that inherits one class from other and then the properties of one class becomes in the other class so that's what the inheritance is and next we have the concept of polymorphism so now what is polymorphism the polymorphism is the combination of two greek words the poly which means many and then the morph which means forms so together the polymorphism means many forms and it says the same entity or an object can be used in various forms like in many forms or we can also say the ability of an object to take many forms so what it means the real world example of polymorphism would be suppose we have a car but is manual means you will drive the car otherwise it won't drive and you want to modify this car and add a feature of self-driving so the car will become automatic and will drive itself so here the result is the car is still driving no matter so here the goal is common but the approach is different means the goal is still driving of the car no matter we add a new feature or not but the approach is different like now the car becomes like a tesla car instead of a manual car so that was the real world example of polymorphism it will become more clear when we implement the polymorphism in dart so now the question arise how we can achieve polymorphism in dart programming language well the method overriding is a technique to achieve polymorphism in dart programming language so now again the question arises what is method overriding so before getting to know about method overriding you must know about inheritance and now what is method overriding so sometimes we want a child class object to give some different results for the same method in the parent class when the child class invokes it like suppose we have this class a and b class extends class a so now when we create the instance of b class in here you can see and we can invoke the same method which is eat so it give us the same result but sometimes if you want this child class or this child class to give some different result on the same method this is called the method overriding so how we can override a method in dart to override method in dart what you have to do simply you have to create the same method which is inside the super class or the parent class so we will do void and eat and body open body and it will print let's say it will say the unknown person is eating and his age is 100 so that's what this eat method will do when we invoke it from the b class instance and now here we have override the method of 
db superclass. So when we are overriding or redefining the same method again in the child class like that, the method must have the same name, the same return type and the same arguments if accepts any and that's it. But will only be annotated with the override notation like override. So now we have achieved the polymorphism in our Dart programming language. You can see in the super class we have the eat method when we invoke it from the class A if we create the object for the A class and when we invoke this method from the instance of A. So this will give us the Steve is eating and his edge is 45. But in case of B when we, when we invoke it from E now B override this method which is in its super class. So now when we invoke it from here so instead of this result this will give us this result which is inside the B class and overridden. So now let's try it out to test it practically. So let's create the A class instance and say object of A equals to A instantiated and here print the object A dot eat. That's it. Now there is an error. The expression has the okay we don't have to print it just because it's already printing and it's void method so we should not uh, type inside the print statements just because it's not a field but a void method. So that's it. Now first of all before running let's comment these two instances out and run this. So we will get this result in our console. You can see Steve is eating and his age is 45. And in the session of inheritance we have tried the eat method from the object C and this gives us the same print statement which is inside the A. But now when we uncomment the B instance and also comment this out print and when we invoke the object B from the object B when we invoke the eat. So this time the eat method is override inside the B and its result is different. So we will get the different result in here. You can see we got eat in here in, in here and B extends A. So instead of getting the same result we got a different result just because of this override. So that's how we can achieve polymorphism in our Dart programming language. To understand it more clearly let me create one more class in here. As I gave the example in the starting the real world example suppose we have a class of car and this car has a method of white and its name is drive. And this method simply prints car is driving manually. So this car drive is driving manually. But we have a class again and his and its name is Tesla car. And this Tesla car extends the car. And here it overrides the same drive method void drive and open body print and this tesla car is driving automatically so what it means first let's correct it extends so now what it means the goal of both of the cars is same but the approach is different like this car is driving manually and this car is driving automatically. So the only difference is this. Now let's create the object for these two classes in here. On top of these two. Here we will create the car and object of car equals to car instantiated. And then let's do object car dot invokes the method which is drive. And also right after this create the instance of Tesla car and here tesla car object will be equals to tesla car and instantiate it and from the tesla car object dot the same drive method so the methods are same you can see in these two classes but this class the tesla car overwrite the drive method of its super class and simply change the 
approach of that drive method like it drive manually and it drive automatically so the goal is same still driving you can see drive and drive but the approach is different so let's comment these out a and b classes and run this so we will get the answer in the console the car is driving manually the tesla car is driving automatically but if we remove this or comment this override method in here so now this car is not overriding the drive method and this car extends the car so this class object also has a drive method so now when we run this now this car or this class is not overriding the method inside its super class so you can see we got the same result in here so that's what the polymorphism is and that's how we can achieve it in our Dart programming language. So up until now, we have covered three topics of object-oriented programming. We have covered the topic of object and classes, inheritance, and the polymorphism. And now it's time to go for the encapsulation. First of all, let's talk about what is encapsulation. Encapsulation means hiding data within a file or a library, preventing it from outside factors. It helps us to control our program and prevent it from becoming too complicated. And remember, Dart encapsulation is at library level, but not at class level. So now the question arises, how we can achieve encapsulation in Dart programming language? First of all, let's clear all these instances from the main and also delete all these classes from here to make these more clear. So how we can achieve encapsulation in our Dart programming language? First of all, let's create a class here. We have this class engine outside from our main method. So Dart do not support the modifiers like public, private and protected to make our fields or methods private. But instead Dart use the underscore to make our fields or methods private. Like inside this engine class, this name field is said to be private. Just because we have used this underscore before this name. So that's how we can make the fields or methods private in our Dart programming language. And to modify the private property, we use getters and setters methods to access and update the value of the private property. Like we can have the getter method first of all string get uh, a keyword to get the to get a property of a class and then its name let's say get name and simply open body just because get method do not can have any function parenthesis like this so inside this this is going to return the name just like this so that's how we can create the get method for our private to get it and then simply the set method will be just like this like the set keyword the name of the function and the parameter it accepts like to modify it on that name just because we have not initialized it and we modify our name and we put the let as a modifier just because it's not initialized and will be initialized later just because of this let and when we call the set name we will set the name which is the parameter of that function and we are saying this dot name equals to this name where this refers to the current instance of the class and here you can see a warning don't access members with this unless avoiding shadows so what it means it means use this keyword only in case if the name is just like this you can see now the warning has gone and it becomes like this so as it is private and we are doing it like this and this keyword is refer to class field and this name is to refer the parameter of this function so this will be only used in case the field of class name and the parameter names are same in case if these are not same you can see the class field name has the underscore before it and is private so if i do it with without this keyword so this will be fixed and the warning will be gone so we can only do this in case if the class field is different from the parameter field if both are same so we can use this keyword to separate the class instance field and the parameter of a function so we create a private field inside the engine class and we have also created the get name and set name helper methods 
to get or set this name just because this will be not allowed outside the library what is a library will be clear it to you in a while so now in the main function we will take the instance of the class and we will do engine and object of engine equals to engine instantiate just like this and from the object engine we can access the name get name and set name like now set the name equals to let's say v8 and then simply print and call the object engine dot get name so we have a private field and we got the getters and setters and now run this we will get the answer we add in the console but that's okay if you can see we can also access the private field name in here and we can directly modify it and can print this name by storing this object engine in the variable let's suppose string a equals to this and simply print this a and run this so we will get the same answer just because we are on the same file on the same library that's how we are allowed to modify or access the private variables of a class so now that's okay to modify the private keyword in a single library or we can say a single dot dot library or file but this class or this name field will not be accessible in the other library let me show you by going to IntelliJ IDE so we are on IntelliJ IDE and we have two different libraries you can see with other library dot dot and dot basic dot dot so we have two different libraries or we can say files of dart and in the dart basics which located in the bin directory we have the main function meaning that we can run this and this will give us the output so here let's not do anything for now and go to the other library and copy the engine class from our dark pad and simply paste it right here so we got this engine class the private variable and the getters and setter for this private field of this engine class and now in the dark basic now i am on the other library now let's take the instance of the engine engine and then object of engine equals to engine so we got the instance of the class and now we can access object engine dot you can see get name and set name but we cannot access the directly name from here just because that's private and that's what i meant by the dot encapsulation is at library level but not at the class level so you can see i cannot access the name keyword which is here private and i cannot access it in here but instead i can use the get name or let's say set name and i can set its name to let's say v7 engine and simply in here i can do now print and object engine dot get name and that's it so now when i run this program in the output you can see we got the v7 engine but directly we cannot access the name keyword in the other library or in the other file and we can import one library in the other library using this import keyword just like this you can see the package dot basics other library dot dart means in the dart basic library or in the dart file we import the other library dart and we got the engine from that other library so that's how the encapsulation is in our dart programming language which means that hiding data within a file or a library and preventing it from outside factors like this name will be only used inside this library but in case if you want to modify it we have to create the getters and setter for that so that will be good otherwise this can make our programs too complicated so that was it for encapsulation in our dart programming language and you will get to know more about this in the future videos so now what is abstraction we have a keyword abstract in our dart programming language like let me show you in here the abstract keyword and in front of it there will be the class like let's say repository and before this we also have to do class abstract class so now that's the abstraction and this abstract class is going to contain the abstract methods 
So what it means by abstract methods, the abstract method means that the methods without the concrete implementation. Like inside this, we are going to have the methods like let's say on void method which print the user name and it also accept one parameter of string name and after this put the semicolon in here and then we are going to have the let's say void print user age and it is going to accept int age in here so inside the abstract class we are going to have the abstract methods means without the concrete implementation but will be only declared and are said to be abstract now to print the username or user as we have to take the instance of the repository class as we have done for some other classes like let's say repository and we will say object of repository and then instantiate the repository repository and then we will get an error just because the abstract classes cannot be instantiated you can also see in here abstract classes cannot be instantiated and the reason behind this is just because they do not have any concrete implementation but only abstract methods so to overcome this we have to implement this repository abstract class by extending it with its subclass so here there will be the implementation for these two methods now we are going to have another class let's say class repository and we will name it repository implementation and this is going to implements the repository so we have this repository implementation class and we have this implement keyword to implement an abstract class so this repository implementation implements this repository which is an abstract class and inside this now we are going to implement these two unimplemented classes to implement them we have to do override and the same word return type the same name and the same parameter and that's it now inside this we will do print hello and simply name and also for the second method we will do the same to override this like this the override the same return type the same name as we have in here and the same parameter and also print it in here using the curly braces to open the body so now so now we have the abstract class and also the abstract class implementation like in the abstract class we are not going to have the concrete implementation of the methods but the class which implements the abstract class is going to have the concrete implementation of the classes which are unimplemented in the abstract class and now we are going to take the instance of repository implementation instead of the only repository just because the abstract class cannot be instantiated because they do not have any concrete implementation and now after creating the instance or the object of the class repository implementation down here we will do object dot repo dot print user edge and simply pass in the parameters 55 and put semicolon here and also in front of this make it equal to this so now when we run this we will get edge equal to 55 in the console you can see edge equal to 55 and also we can print the other method like object repo dot print the username and pass the username in here let's say steve and simply just like this run this so it will say hello steve so we got the same expected output so that was our abstract classes which contains the methods without the concrete implementation so that then we have to implement the abstract class to implement its methods concrete implementation and in here we have to override them the same return type the same name the same arguments and simply the action we want to perform in the body and it's also like the polymorphism like here we have the only method which does nothing but in the repository we are overriding it with the same return type same function name same arguments and simply doing something on it so it has two forms in the abstract class it does nothing but in the repository implementation class it prints hello and the name which we pass as a parameter as an argument in this print user name method so that's what the abstract classes are in our dart programming language and also you will get to know more about these abstract classes when you go for real app development of flutter so now the last remaining topic is 
Mixin. We learn about object and classes, inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation, and abstractions in our Dart programming language. And now again, the last topic is Mixin. And now we are going to explore this Mixin. But before this, let me clear one more thing about the abstract classes. That is, if you look at in the class repository which is an abstract class a class containing an abstract method must be declared abstract so that's okay this class can contain abstract so this is declared as abstract but we can also directly implement these methods like to directly open the body and simply print this and say hello this is my this edge and that's it and now this body will be overrided by this print user edge in the repository implementation class which is the polymorphism so the thing i want you to understand about abstraction is the abstract classes is the classes will only be declared abstract when the class has one or more abstract classes like this class can also have the concrete implementation it's not like that that this class is declared as abstract so this cannot have the concrete implementation no it's not like this it can also have the concrete implementation of the methods but in case if you want a class to also hold the abstract methods mean the abstract means the methods without implementation so that's when we will declare a class as an abstract but in case if you don't want a class to have or to hold the abstract method like the methods without implementation so this will be just like this remove this from here so now you will see an error in this class just because the class declared just like this like the regular classes must have the body to implement like when i open the body of this so the error will be gone so but in case if you want a class to hold the abstract classes also so that's when the class will be declared as an abstract and it can also have the concrete implementation and this concrete implementation will be overridden in this repository implementation class here so that's the thing i wanted you to know also about the abstract classes so now it's time to go for the mixins so a mixin is a class whose methods and properties can be used by other classes without inheriting this class with the other classes in which we want the functions and the properties. Or we can also say mixin are reusable chunk of code that can be plugged in to any other class that needs the functionality of the other class. L like suppose here we have an abstract class just like this and has a methods of drive and then we have three more classes just like this and these two classes extends the car class just like this so now one common thing in these all cars are that can drive and that's why they extends the car class so now when we create the instance of the honda toyota or tesla class so we can have this drive method also in the instances of these classes so now let's go ahead and create two more classes just like this we have created auto drive and manual drive class so that some cars are manually drive by humans and some cars are automatically drive like the tesla so now these cars are driving honda toyota and tesla but this tesla car can drive automatically and this honda and toyota can drive manually as these classes already extends the car which is driving which is common in all these classes and when we want to again extend the honda with manual drive so we cannot do this just because dart do not supports the multiple inheritance dart can only inherit one classes using this extends keyword and here we already said the multiple inheritance is not supported in dart programming language so to overcome this issue instead of the classes we will use the mixin and also copy this and paste it right here and with this honda we will do with manual drive so by doing this with keyword we got the mixin manual also in this honda class like we mix the manual drive mixin in the honda class and also we will do with manual car for toyota and for tesla we will do the with auto drive so now when we create the instance of the honda class so we can have the drive and the 
manual drive also which is the same driving or manual driving but in case of tesla we have the drive and also the manual drive and that's how we solved that issue now we got the auto driving and the driving in the tesla and also the manual driving and the driving in the honda and toyota so now let's go and take the instance of these classes like in here in the main method we will do let's say honda and object of honda and let's instantiate it just like this now from object of honda we can have the drive and the manual drive so when we do drive and right after this we do object honda dot manual drive so both will works and also put the equal to in here and comment this out to work only on these mixins now run this so we will get the driving and also the manual driving you can see it in here we got the expected output but in case of tesla if you do tesla object of tesla equals to tesla instantiated and in the object of tesla we can have the drive and auto drive so that's how the mixins are in our dart programming language so that was also it for our object oriented programming concepts we have learned all these concepts object and classes inheritance polymorphism encapsulation abstraction and lastly the mixins so let's take a quick recap of all these the classes the classes are like a container to store the organized information in a container like class and simply if we need it in some other library or module so we just have to take the instance of the class and simply access the information we have in the class and next we have the objects the objects are the instances like this and the inheritance we learned about the four types of inheritance the single inheritance multiple multi-level and hierarchical we have talked about single multi-level and hierarchical and the multiple inheritance is not supported which problem is solved by these mixins right now and then we have learned about the polymorphism like an object or entity can have many forms if like if you want a child class object to give some different results for the same method in the parent class so for that we have the polymorphism and in the polymorphism we have the method overriding in the dart programming language to achieve polymorphism and next we have the encapsulation means hiding data within a file or a library and to prevent it from outside factors and keep our program simple and stopping it from being too complicated like keeping data in one library or a file so that we can use it only in here but not the outside so if you want a variable or a function to be available in the single library or dart file so simply we will prefix it with the underscore like this so we have achieved the encapsulation in our dart programming language and in the languages like java and some other in these languages we have the public private protected keywords to achieve the encapsulation like data hiding just like this and next we also learn the abstraction like if we want a class to have the abstract methods the methods without implementation is said to be abstract methods so if you want a class to have the abstract methods like this so you will simply declare a class as abstract and that's it and next we have learned about the mixins which is in front of you we have done in here to solve the multiple inheritance issue so that was all about object oriented programming that you need to know before starting flutter app development so now let's go for the forward topics after setting up flutter sdk in your operating system whether it's mac os linux or windows this time you have to go and download android studio to download android studio you have to move to your browser and search for Android Studio and then click on the very first link. Then download the Android Studio latest version from here. So after installing Android Studio with the necessary SDK tools and the emulator stuff and then you open the Android Studio you will see this welcome page of Android Studio. And you will not have this new Flutter project in here because to work with Flutter and Android Studio you have to download some plugins. So directly you have to move to your plugins and search for flutter in the marketplace 
and then download the flutter and the other necessary tools like i have downloaded flutter assets flutter snippets and all of the other tools like this one flutter snippet and then you also have to download dart from here and also the dart to json tools and other useful snippets after your flutter and dart plugins are downloaded this time your android studio will not look very great so to make a productive theme that i have you can see for that you have to download the material theme ui this one and also the atom material icons for the directories and after this is installed what you have to do is to restart your android studio and go for creating a new flutter project from here or if you don't have this option of create new flutter project so what you have to do simply open up your terminal and go for flutter create and then name of your project so your flutter project will be created in the specified directory like such as i want to create a flutter projects and download so i will cd to downloads and then i will create flutter create and then the project name in here so my project will be created in the downloads with that name that i specified in here and then open up your project from the android studio if your flutter project is created and you don't have the material darker theme like i have one so for that to enable all the things in the toolbar of the material theme that i have in here you have to go to the view and the appearance just take that toolbar so that toolbar will be appear with the options of with the different options of the material theme and other plugins and next if your theme is not applied on this coding area so for that you have to go to your file not the file but the settings and then go for the editor and inside the editor there you will find the color scheme inside the color scheme go to the color scheme font and then change the scheme to material darker and from here you can also select other fonts and the line height and the size and for the console font you can change this console font and the console colors from here so after that you have this productive theme set up like i have one it's material darker theme in the android studio so after setting up everything in the android studio like installing plugins creating project installing sdk modifying theme and all of this stuff so after creating the project first of all this readme.md file will appear in front of you and it has first of all the flutter basic the name of our project and then the description of our project which we have just set default and default was a new flutter project and here is the get started get started means the these instructions that how to get started with flutter they also give some links so they can take you to the website and from there you can learn the flutter basics and also the advanced concepts from their official website flutter.dev or docs.flutter.dev so there's the readme file with some instructions and also some links and in the left corner you will see all the directories of a flutter project so as flutter is cross-platform so we can build applications for android and ios from only single code base which is dart and we have already learned the basics of Dart programming language. And first of all in here, we don't need to touch any directory in here. First of all, our main focus will be on the lib directory and also the pubspec.yaml file. And we are not going to touch any of these libraries. First of all here, we have also the test library in which we have the widget test Dart library or a file we can say here is the main for the test just because that is test and there is some written test for the counter demo application which is located in the lib directory so we will come to this demo application in a while first let's go to the pubspec.yaml file and here that's our pubspec.yaml file which contains the metadata of a project and also is used to add some dependencies of the project so first of all here we have the our project name the description and publish to is none just because we are not publishing it right now so for now it's none and here is the environment our sdk version of dart and here is the dependencies and dev dependencies to add some dependencies to our project and use them 
right away like we have the dependency of cappuccino icons so we are allowed to use the cappuccino icons in our flutter application and the div dependency like the flutter lens so what's the difference between the dependencies and also the dev dependency so these dependencies are only required by your application in the production like when our application comes to the production mode so these will be used in here but on the other hand the dev dependencies that are only needed for local development and also for retesting so that's the difference between dependencies and the dev dependencies and here we have the uses material design to true meaning that we are going to use the material design and it is allowed by setting this true and we can also add the assets to our flutter application by uncommenting this but we will do it in the next section and here we can also add some custom funds to our application so that's all about the pubspec.yaml file that you need to know before going to the other stuff like widgets and some others so first of all let's go to the main.dart here is the demo application made by the flutter developers that is the application and let me run it in here so i run the application on the emulator as i said as an emulator we will use the Jenny motion device to run our emulator on this so you can use any emulator you like like the android emulator like this one here you can download it from here i already have this other also but i like this Jenny motion just because that is not so much laggy and is smooth to use and do not require any additional setup this is also do not require any additional setup but is laggy in some cases so anyways first of all here in the main.dart we have run our application which is a simple counter application in here there's the app bar and that's our application when we click this button so this will increment one two three four five and just like this and that is the simple application already built by flutter developers so first of all let me tell you one thing everything in flutter is called a widget so what is widget a widget is an immutable description of a part of the ui and also to make it more clear if you are already familiar with the platforms like android and ios the native development of these platforms we had the views in the android development and also the ui views in the ios development so the widgets are something like this or we can also say the widget is the way to declare or construct the ui like this this is a simple application this floating action button is also a widget this an app bar is also a widget this text inside this is a widget and this text and this text is also a widget and this is aligned vertically means it's inside the column so that column is also a widget so everything inside the flutter or in the flutter we can say is widget and then there is the parts of widget the stateless widget and also the stateful widget so what's the difference between the stateless widget and the stateful widget so the stateless widget in simple words if a widget does not do anything like do not hold any data it's also obvious from its name like it's stateless widget it does not hold any state to do anything with state changes and something like this so that is stateless widget so in simple words we can say that stat that does not do anything is said to be the stateless widget but on the other hand we have the stateful widget it's also obvious from its name the stateful widget in simple words we can also say the widget which does something means to hold the stat and do some ui changes by changing the stat of the widget like here if you open this emulator and close this keyboard when i click this so this stat it changes and update this counter by one by updating the ui means it change its stat so that's why it is called the stateful widget so that all work we are doing in the stateful widget and we are calling this increment counter in here and we are updating the stat by the set style you are looking to know about these methods and these widgets in more detail in a while just because now we are just understanding it that how these widgets works like the stateless and the stateful the stateful widget the widget that can hold some stat and also can change the stat by setting the stat like this and also the stateless widget which do not hold any stat and is stateless and 
the state that does not do anything. So that's the difference between stateless and stateful widget. So here let me show you one more thing. This build method, override build method which return type is widget. So what this build method does, it's again obvious from its name to build something on the UI. Like the build method is only called to build the UI and it describes the part of the user interface represented by a widget. Like this my app stateless widget only returns the material app and that's the work of this widget. So that build or return the material app for us and then in the home we are calling the my home page which is also a stateful widget and the stateful widget is again have the build method which builds all of these widgets inside this and show it up in the UI. So that's the build method inside the widgets. So that was all about the stateless and the stateful widgets. So now let's start from this import. So to deal with material design as we have seen in here in the pubspec.yaml file as this is a true means we will use the material design. So we will import the material dot dot to use the material design in our app and next we have the man method. You are already familiar with this man method. We had used this method to run our code on the dark pad and here this man method is used to run our application. It accept the widget like this. So we are passing the my app widget in here and here this my app called its build and it on our material app the material app is also a widget so this material app here means the an application that uses material design in flutter must have this material app and this give us also some other widgets or properties of this like the title the title of our material app the theme property to deal with some themes in here and this property accepts a theme data which is also itself a widget and here this home property accepts again a widget and this widget has a build method here which again builds this UI and here that is the stateful widget that holds stats and here we have the variable which we are updating by calling this increment method. So that was the material app and next we have here the scaffold on top of all these widgets and under the material app like here we are calling the home page so on top of that we have the material app and here this is under or inside the material app widget so these are also called the parent and the child widget like here if you see that is the parent widget and here in the body the center and some other widgets are the child widgets of that. You can see that's the parent and that's the child of it and now that's the child of that parent. So just like this they are divided into parent and child widget just like this. And that scaffold is also a widget which is used under the material app as I said and build smooth mobile app UI and also give us many basic functionality or properties like this app bar and with some text and also some other the bottom navigation bar you will see it in the next section that how we can build the bottom navigation bar and also the drawer of the application. So this UI or this app bar is provided by the scaffold. So when I remove the scaffold from here like let's close this center cut this from here and paste it on this whole scaffold and put this semicolon in here. Now press ctrl s to hot reload which is I already had said the hot reload is the beautiful feature of the flutters like we don't have to restart the whole application just press ctrl and s on your keyboard and there you go you had reflected your changes on the emulator you can see we got this black UI and we cannot interact it with just like this just because we have removed the scaffold from here so that's the scaffold by ctrl z doing undo it will becomes again like this that is our scaffold widget which builds the smooth mobile app ui and also give us many functionalities so now again ctrl s and open up the emulator so our ui become again like this so that was all about the flutter widgets like everything in flutter is said to be or is called a widget and that was the stateless and the stateful widgets so I have deleted all the comments from here 
and we talk about this import to import the flutter material dart to use the material design in our application and this is our main method it has the run app method which accepts the widget in here and that widget which we pass in here becomes the root of our project like this my app widgets or material app becomes the root of our widget tree like first we have this widget and then this home page return the scaffold like this i remove the stateful widget from here just because we are going to learn the other widgets of flutter so that was our material app to use material design in here that's the title again same theme data primary switch equal to blue like the app bar color will be set to blue and also to remove this debug banner from here in the flutter material app here we have the debug show check mode banner set it to false and hit ctrl and s open up your emulator and it's removed so that's our material app and in the home we are returning the home page stateless widget and it has the build and it returns scaffold and app bar so in the app bar we are doing nothing for now first of all now we are going to learn the widgets row and column of flutter so what is row and column they are obvious from their name like let me comment it out in here we are going to learn the row and column they are obvious from their name the row is to align the widgets or the content on the ui horizontally and the column is used to align the contents or the widgets of the ui vertically so that's all the rows and columns and that's how they can be used and here remove the center from here and put a column in here so we can create a column in flutter just like this and also for making it more clear let's also put the title of app bar like row and column and next this column accept the list of widgets like as we had in the dart on the right bottom corner we had the documentation now when i hover this children you can see this accept the list of widgets so this will build the widgets vertically on our ui so first of all our ui looks something like this when you control s hot reload and open up your emulator our ui looks something like this we have row and column in the app bar and we have nothing on our ui so first of all in here in the column we have a widget text just like this one and with this we have also a widget the container inside the container we have the properties of width and height and also the decoration so the width and height accept the double value like we can pass with 200 and height also 200 so the height and width of the container will be 200 and 200 and this decoration accepts the box decoration widget and again inside this we have some properties like the border radius color border blend mode box shadow gradient image and shape like to change the shape put the image on the container change its color and border radius and also in the container we have some properties like color clip behavior margin child padding alignment constraints foreground decoration and some other properties like transform and transform alignment which accept their appropriate widget which is shown in front of them like color clip edge insert geometry and widget and all of that so first of all here we will put the color of the container which accepts the color class inside the class we have different colors like we can access the colors from this class by doing the colors and dot notation so i an intelligence will appear and we have all of these colors in our colors class so we will change our container color to red and now when we control and s to hot reload and open up our emulator so we got this container with 200 width and height so again if you minimize this and again if you copy this container and paste it two more times just like this so we got these three containers inside the one column widget and now when we again press ctrl and s and open up our emulator so we will get three containers aligned vertically but there is no space right now between them so for that 
we have the properties of margin and padding inside the container. So the margin accepts edge inserts class which extends the edge inserts geometry and from this class we can access the dot zero symmetric only all and also from LTRB and from window padding. So we are going to do the all from all sides put the margin about 10 and it also accept the double value as you can see in here and the padding except the same widget like copy this and paste it in here. So the margin means the space outside the box or the container and the padding means the space inside the box. So now when we press Ctrl and S hot reload and open up our emulator. So you can see we got some spacing around this container but for the other two we didn't get any margin or padding outside or inside just because we have to put these properties also in the other containers. So after putting the margin and padding properties inside the containers, again control S to hot reload and open up the emulator. So you can see we got the space between them and that are aligned vertically. But in case if we reduce their size to 50 and reflect in all just like this. So we have changed their height and width and now when we change this column to row and again control and s to hot reload and again open up the emulator so we will get these container aligned horizontally with some spaces between them so you can see we got these three small containers on top left and they are now aligned horizontally so that's the difference between row and column so now it's time to explore the properties of column and then we will go for the row so let's again change the row to column and here we have some properties inside the column. The most used properties of column is cross axis alignment and man axis alignment. So what that means? The only cross axis alignment of a column is the horizontal alignment of the widgets inside the column like this. And the man axis alignment of a column is the vertical alignment of the widgets inside the column list of children. First of all, let's comment this cross axis alignment first of all we are going to check the main axis alignment so again we have this main axis alignment and from this main axis alignment we can access some values like space between start space around center center space even list and some values which accept the list of main axis alignment values so first of all let's check it out the space between the space between means the max spacing between all these containers. So now let's make it space between and main axis alignment of a column is vertical. So we will get one container on top and one in, in the mid and one at the bottom. So now press Ctrl S to hot load and open up the emulator to see the results. So we got this result on our UI. The space between means this and next property of column main axis alignment is the the space around it's obvious from its name the space around now press ctrl s to hot reload and open up the emulator so we got some space around them and the other property is space evenly to put the even space between all these containers now ctrl s to hot reload and open up the emulator to see the results so we got the space evenly results just like this and the other property is start to put all these properties in the start. Now control S to hot reload and open up the emulator. So we got all the widgets inside the container, inside the column in start. And with this we have the property of end to align all these widgets of the column in the end. Control S to hot reload and again open up the emulator. So you can see we got all the widgets of the column list aligned at the end. And we also have the property of center to align all the widgets of the column list in the center. Control S to hot reload, open up the emulator and we got all the widgets aligned in the center. So that was the main axis alignment of column. Now let's comment this main axis alignment and uncomment this cross axis alignment. So the cross axis alignment of the column is horizontal, like the horizontal alignment of the column list widgets like these containers so this 
cross axis alignment accepts the cross axis alignment in the cross axis alignment we have the property of center now when we press ctrl s and open up the emulator so we got the widgets in here that is because the column cannot take all the space horizontally so that will remain in here and the other property of the cross axis alignment is start which means the same like it will remain at the start and again the end will also not work just because again the column does not take all the available space horizontally and next we have the property of stretch now when we control s to hot reload and open up the emulator so we have stretch our containers and that took all the horizontal space just like this so that was the main properties of a column and now let's go for the row first of all let's control s to hot reload and open up the emulator so we got the containers aligned horizontally now the main axis alignment of row is horizontal alignment of the widgets inside the list children's of the row so first of all we have the center now when you press ctrl s so all the widgets inside the row children list will be aligned horizontally in the center now open up the emulator to see the results so you can see we got the widgets aligned in the center and next we have the end property to align it at the end like it will become at the right corner and the same we have the space evenly space around space between so the space between means as i said one widget will be aligned at the most left and the other will be in the center and the third will be at the rightmost but if there were two widgets so that will be aligned on the corners like the leftmost and the rightmost so that is the main axis alignment of row and the same will be the cross axis alignment of the row and when we open up the emulator so we will get all the containers stretched vertically just because now the cross axis alignment of a row widgets is vertical so you can see we got three widgets stretched to the bottom just because there's the cross axis alignment of the row and also some other properties you can explore by yourself so that was all about the row and column widget and their properties and also we learned the container and we will go in more depth for these widgets and the next sections of flutter so now we are going to learn the two most important widgets of flutter that are used in rows and columns so these widgets are the flexible and expanded so down here we have the same home page and inside we have the scaffold and the rows and containers which we have learned in the previous sections of rows and columns and i also have separate the rows and columns in the next stateless widget in r to keep our sections separate so now we have learned the rows and columns and now we will learn some other things and will perform it in here in the home page and then we will also separate it in here so for that i have created another library or we can say a file of dart and simply separate it in the stateless widget so now we are going to learn the two other widgets that are the expanded and flexible but before going forward let me clear one more thing that is we have this emulator and we have the fixed size of our screen but in our rows and columns if we set the width or height of a widget too high so it will overflow from the screen and will give us an error with such a long stack in our run console so let me show you that if we set the width of this first container to 1000 and simply press the ctrl and s to hot reload and again open up our run console so you can see in here we got this long stack in here and it's saying the render flex overflowed by 680 pixels on the right just because we have increased our width with 1000 so in this case what we will do so we will use these expanded or flexible widget when some render flex exception occur so now the question is how we can use it in our flutter application to overcome this render flex or flood by 680 pixels on the right first let's understand some concept of this expanded and flexible widget the expanded widgets expand a child of a row or column at the main axis alignment and take all the available space but on the other hand the flexible widget will do same like this but there is only a little difference between these two widgets that's why i wrote their description 
the SAM. So now let's go and use them. So down here in the row, we have this container which has the width 1000 and overflowed from the screen at the right side. And this in our emulator looks something like this. You can see it in the emulator. It's overflowed from the right side by 680 pixels which looks really small in here and you can see this banner in here. So now to overcome this, first we will wrap this container with an widget. That will be our expanded widget. So after wrapping this container with the expanded widget, this will take all the available space at the main axis alignment of the row. So the main axis alignment of the row is horizontal. So it will take all the horizontal space that is available. So now press Ctrl and S to hot reload to check the results on our emulator. Now open up the emulator and you can see it got all the available space except the space that is used by the two other widgets that are our containers. And also with this, the render flex exceptions is also gone from here. Just because this expanded widget expands or make our container flexible to not overflow from the screen and simply take only that space that is available at the main axis alignment of the row. Now no matter, if you increase this width of container to 2000 or 3000 or 4000 or even 10,000 this will not affect this just because we have expanded it and it make it flexible to take only the space that is available at the main axis alignment of the particular widget that is our row if it were the column so it will take all the available space at the main axis alignment of the column that is the vertical space just because the main axis alignment of the column is vertical now press again ctrl s to also check this 10,000 width you can see nothing happens just because it takes only the available space that is available at the main axis alignment of the row. And also if we change this, expand it to flexible. So now press Ctrl and S to also see its results. So you can see it give us the same result as the expanded. But now if we change the width of the container to again 50, just like this. And again press Ctrl and S to run this, just like this and open up your emulator you can see it does not take any available space but in case of expanded even if we do not specify the 1000 or 100,000 width to the container this will still take all the available space let me show you in here if we make again this container expanded and now we have not give the 1000 width to overflow from the screen and again if we press ctrl and s and open up our emulator so this will still take all the available space at the main x alignment of the particular widget but the widget flexible in the result it do not take all the available space and give us the result something like this so what's the difference between them so the difference between them is the flexible widget will share the available space of the parent widget but will not force the child to take all the available space and fit in the main axis alignment fully of the particular widget like row and column. But on the other hand, the expanded will share the available space of the parent widget and force the child to change its width or height in case of rows and columns to fill all the available space. And you have seen this already. We have used the flexible widget. So here you can see it is not forcing the child container to take all the available space. But in case of expanded, if you make it just like this and again press Ctrl and S to hot reload and open up our emulator. So you can see it takes all the available space at the main axis alignment of the row and force this first container to change its width or height width in case of row and height in case of column and will take all the available space so it took all the available space just like this and we can also do one more thing in here what if we make all these three widgets expanded just like this now press ctrl and s to hot reload and open up the emulator to see its result so three of the containers got the same space in here so as we have wrapped three of the containers in the expanded so that took all the available space and become equal just like this and we have one property in our expanded widget that is the flex property now if we set this flex to let's say two so this will take more space than these two expanded widgets or these two containers wrapped by the expanded widget. Now press Ctrl and S to hot reload and open up the emulator. You can see this container got 
more space or redouble space and give them the space like this and they are covering all the available space as these are the expanded widgets and this can also be like in the column to make this column now again press ctrl and s to hot reload and open up the emulator so now it expands at the main axis alignment of the column and the first container widget is larger than the other two like this is larger than this these two just because it has flex too and also if we remove the width and height of these containers just like this so they will cover the whole screen of the mobile like ctrl s to hot reload and open up the emulator so these three containers took all the available space just like this the first container is larger than these two just because as i said we have set the flex to two just like this and if we set this flex to three and again press ctrl s to hot reload so this will take more space just like this so you can use this expanded and flexible widget to make the flexible ui for your application and these expanded and flexible widgets will only be used inside the rows and the columns and you will learn more about them if we go for building a beautiful ui for our application so for now that was it about the flexible and expanded that you need to know about these widgets so we learned about the widgets like rows and columns and also the flexible and the expanded and now we are going to learn the one most more powerful widget of flutter that is stack the stack widget is a built-in widget in Flutter which allows us to make the layer of widgets by putting them on top of each other. Like sometimes a simple row and column layout is not enough. We need some way to overlay one widget on top of the other. Like we want to create some circle and on top of that we want to show an image. So how the scenario can be achieved? That's where the stack widget of Flutter comes in. So now let's see how we can use this widget in Flutter. So down here we have the center widget. So let's remove it and put the stack in here. So we got the widget stack in here, which same like the rows and columns accepts the list of children just like this. Now inside this we will create three widgets of container with some width and height and some color. So we got these three containers inside our stack widget. Now after this run your app on your emulator and after this your app will look something like this. So we only got the widget in the top left corner. So we got that container widget which has the color blue in here. And that container is here right after these two containers. And the other two container widgets which has the color of red and also the green that are behind this blue container widget. Just because let me show you in here. Minimize this emulator and in here give some margin to all these containers. So we got the margin in our containers and we used the only from left and top 10 and for the second container we got from left 20 and from top 20 and in the third container we got only from left 30 and from top 30. So now let's control and S to hot reload and open up your emulator. So you can see these widgets. The widgets inside the stack look something like this. And as I said they make a layer of widgets and are on top of each other so now we are going to talk about the child of stack stack widget has two types of child the position and the non-position so these widgets inside the stack is called the non-position widgets of the stack but on the other hand the position widget must be wrapped with the widget that is position so let's wrap this container widget with the position widget so now this container is the position widget of the stack and these two are the non-position widgets of the stack so now what this position widget does we are going to talk about this in a while so the alignment of non-position child widget of the stack is top left corner like you can see in our emulator we have these three widgets aligned at the top left corner of our emulator so that's the alignment of non-position widgets or childs inside the stack and the position widget has some properties like left right top and bottom like we can position this child of the widget which is position wrapped by position anywhere we want so we have these widgets inside the position so now let's say i want to align or position this position widget of this stack 
by let's say from bottom 5 from top also 5 from right also 5 and from left also the 5 now control s to hot reload and open up your emulator to see the result of this position widget of our stack so now let's open it up so we got this container or the widget of the stack in here it comes in here so now when we comment out its margin to remove its margin from left 30 and from top 30 and again open it up you can see it came in here from bottom we gave it some 5 and from right and from left and from top so that's how we position widget in this stack using this position widget of flutter and that position widget will only be used inside the stack you cannot use this inside the row and column otherwise this will cause the exception of incorrect use of the parent widget so it simply means change your parent widget like if you want to use the position widget so it must be inside the children of the stack and if you want to use the flexible and expanded so it must not be in the stack but inside the rows or the columns so that was our position widget that how we can align or position the widget inside the stack and one other example of that will be let's remove these two widgets from here and let's only leave this one container and also wrap this with the widget position and you can position this widget anywhere like let's say from left it will be 50 and from right it will be also the 50 now control is to hot reload and open up your emulator so it looks something like this from left we got the 50 and from right we also got the 50 and also remove this margin from here to make it more clear just because this margin disturb this like from left and top we are already giving the margin so this disturb this left and right position of this container now open it up and you can see we got this from here but from the top it is removed just because we have just removed this or uncomment or comment this margin and let's say from top i want to give some 100 and control s to hot reload open it up so we can align it anywhere like let's say we want to align it bottom 5 so it will become a bit up from the bottom like let's control s and hot reload and you can see it comes just like this and also if you want to expand this single widget on the on the whole screen we will do from left 5 and from right 5 and from top also 5 so this will give some size from bottom left right and top and will look something like this like you can see we got this from top from right from bottom and from left and we can also give some negative number in here like let's say minus 50 so this will result in something like this like from bottom you can see there is not any space in here but if you do in here like like let's remove this top from here and again control s to hot reload so it comes just like this and there is no space at the bottom just because we have set this bottom to minus 50 and if we set this to 10 so this will comes just like this some space from the bottom and if we give some let's say 100 from left and again check this you can see we got this 100 from left so that's how we use the position widget in the stack and that's how we align or position or let's say make the layer of widgets in the stack so we will go in more depth using the stacks and rows and columns in here and also the flexible and expanded in the future videos and this will become more clear to you when you go forward and use these widgets in the real app development so be sure you practice all of these widgets so that will be good for you if you want to become in-demand flutter developer so up until now we have learned so many widgets of flutter and some of the most important are rows and columns flexible and expanded and also the stack and the position so let's utilize these widgets together and let's build this simple login page ui in flutter and we also separate our lessons in the separate directories in here so this is not going to be confusing for you to get the code from the github so first of all down here we have again a scaffold and app bar with the text widget of login page and here you can see we got the login page text in the app bar and we got the center widget in the body but for now let's remove the center widget and put the column widget in here so we got the column widget in here 
we have created the column widget in the root just because if you see in this login page we have all the contents align vertically like first we have an image of flutter and we have some text in front of it and then we have a text field and one more field and some text to forget password and a button of login and here at the bottom we have the new user or create account so everything's aligned like vertically just like this so that's why we are using the column so before going and start building this login page first of all we have to add the access of images in our flutter application to get the images and show it up on our emulator so in the webspec.yaml file if you move a bit down you will see this flutter tag in here and you will also see this use material design equal to true and here you will see this assets commented out so from here we will allow access to use assets in our flutter application so in here first of all in our project directory here we will right click and will create new directory in our project directory its name will be assets and that's it in here and now in here we will uncomment these assets and move them one space back remove this one and also move this one space back and here we will specify the name of our directory which is assets and we will put the slash meaning we are putting the path in here and at last we will put the dot meaning that allow access to all the images inside the assets directory and now we are going to add the flutter image in our asset directory so we got this flutter.png in our asset directory you can download this image directly from my github account and also you can download it from the google and after this done you have to go to your pubspec.yml file again and simply press the pubgit to update the dependencies just because we have added this pubspec.yml file so after editing it we have to pubgit in here so all the dependencies have gotten and now let's go to the main.tart and in here if you are using android studio if you see this buff spec has been edited get the dependencies simply ignore it just because we have already done it once so in here first of all we are going to have the image of flutter so to get the image of flutter we are going to have the widget of image dot which is the constructor of this image class that is asset and it accepts some string we will pass the string in here and the string is going to accept the path of our image so our image is located at the asset slash flutter dot png now after adding this simply control s to hot reload so you will get this flutter image on your emulator but if once if the image is not loaded so what you have to do is simply close your main dot dot and run it again so this will be gotten so we got our flutter image in here and now look at the image in here so we have this flutter and in front of it we have the text widget so what it means they are in the row like first we have the image and then we have the text so inside this column we will wrap this image widget in the row just like this and also to decrease the size of the image we will wrap this image with the container and set its width and height so we wrap our image as a widget with the container widget and we set the width and height 200 now press ctrl and s to hot reload to see the results so you can see we got the flutter image in here just like this and now we want some text in front of it so in here in the children of row you can see there's the children of row that's our row widget and there's the children of row and outside this in here that's the column like here will comes our the the text fields and this text and also this button and also this one but here we have two image and the text align in the row so that's why we are using row in here so right after this container in the children of this row we will put in here some text and that will be flutter and after this press ctrl and s to hot reload so we also got this flutter text in here so i want to increase its size so here inside the text we have the property of style and the style accept the text style widget and inside the text style we set the font size to 50 and the font weight to font weight w400 means a little bit bold now after this also ctrl s to hurt reload so we got flutter just like this so now we want all these things aligned in the center 
just like this so for that we have the property of main axis alignment in the column so we will set the main axis alignment to center of the column after this control s to hurt reload so we got this in the center and also to make this align like horizontally so we will also set the main axis alignment of row to the center so we got this here in the center now that was it for our row and now we will close this row here let's take a look once more we have the container which wraps the image asset widget which is our this flutter image logo and right after this we have this text widget and if you want some space between these two widgets this image and this text so here we have the property of size box which accepts width or height so this width and height means if we are putting the size box or the space between the widgets that are aligned vertically meaning in the column so we will set the height in here so as we are in the row so for that we have set the width to put some space between the widgets horizontally meaning in the row so we will set it let's set 10 and control s to hurt reload you can see we got a little space between these two widgets and that's how we use the size box widget now close this row just like this and after this put some vertical space let's say size box and height of let's say 20 and right after this what we are going to have is this text field so now how we can create text field in our flutter we can create text field using the text form field widget and also to design it a little bit it has the property of decoration as we had in the container but instead of box decoration it accepts the input decoration and in the hint text we pass the email and in the border we pass only the outline input border meaning the outline border for the text form field now control s to hot reload so we got one field in here that has the hint text of email and also the, in the decoration we pass the outline input border to get the outline input border to our field and inside this we can type something just like this and right after this we want one more widget of text form field so simply we will copy the size box and we'll paste it right after this text form field and also copy this text form field and paste it right after this and simply change it to password now again control s to hot reload so we got these two widgets or text form fields in our ui and we can also type it in here just like this and what if we increase the size to let's say 40 to make it more clear just like this but in here let's say 25 because these two are fields and that's good but what if i want some spacing horizontally in here at the sides like in here so for that we also can wrap single widgets these text with padding and set some margin to it but that's not just a good practice to wrap each widget with the column and set the margin simply go for the root container and simply wrap it with the widget and that widget will be container and let's set its margin and edge inset start symmetric which accepts the horizontal and vertical like vertically it will give the space from here also and from here also but if we set the horizontal so it will give from both sides like from here from from left also and from right also so here we'll set the horizontal let's say 15 and control s to hot reload you can see we got the horizontal space from both of the sides on our screen so instead of setting or wrapping these two widgets with the container and setting the margin individually for these two widgets we simply wrap our root container not the container but the column and set the horizontal margin just like this and this solve our problem in here so we got our fields of email and password we got the image we got the text and now next what we want in here is the text of forget password which color is blue so let's also do this so right after these two text form fields in here first we will put some size box so again we will copy the size box and right after this we will paste it and then we will put some text in here like the text and inside this we will type forget password and also put the question mark in here 
and again the text widget has the property of style so we will style this forget password text a little bit so we give some style to our text which is forget password and we set the font size to 16 the font width to w500 we can also set the direct bold the like the fully bold but we want to give some a little bold so we set the w500 and also we set the color to color start blue so the text color will be changed to blue and after this control s to hot reload so you can see we got this forget password right after these two fields now next what we want in here that is the button so again we will copy this size box and paste it right after this text widget and in here to create this beautiful button in here we are going to have a container and the container height is going to have let's say 50 and in here we will put the decoration but now this is the container and this is going to accept the box decoration just like this and inside this we will set the color of the container to blue just like this now ctrl s to hot reload and we got this container in here and you can see we have not specified the width of the container but still we got this container with the maximum width so inside the column if we create a column and do not specify the width to it so it will take the dynamic width until the container do not have the child widget but in case if you pass or create the child widget of the container so that dynamic width will be overrided by that child and this width will be set to the minimum size of this child of the container like first of all this is a container of max width even we have do not specified it in here and the width is dynamic means the by default max width and here first of all style it and then you will go for adding the child so you will see how this child will override the dynamic width of the container so put the comma in here and we will first of all make the rounded borders to it so put the comma in here and here we will do border radius to make it the rounded borders so this border radius except the border radius and this is the class which accepts the border radius geometry you can also check it in here by holding the control and go to its documentation this is the border radius class which extends the border radius geometry and it has the constructor of the circular which accepts the circular in the double so this will give us the rounded borders for our container so let's go again and call this circular constructor from this border radius class and set the border radius to let's say 20 Ctrl S to hot reload so we got the circular borders for our button and now let's specify the child to see the magic now let's say the child and the text will be login Ctrl S to hot reload and there we go the dynamic width is overrided by the text widget and this tag only the space which the login text required so now we are going to set our height for the container to override the minimum width of our child widget of the container so we will set 300 or oh, let's also specify the width 300 control s to hot reload and that's good that's how our button will going to look like now let's also style this login so let's copy this style widget from here and put comma in here and simply paste it in here and simply change its color to white colors dot white and that's it and also increase its size to 18 control s to hot reload and we got login like this let's change its font weight to bold to make it fully bolded and also if we say 20 so that will be good so that's it we got login in here but we want this in the center so how we can make this text widget in the center of this container so there are three ways to do it the first way is we have the property inside the column that is the property of alignment inside the column inside the container not in the column so that alignment except the alignment dot 
and center left bottom center bottom left bottom right center right and all of these so we'll simply set this to center control s to hot reload and we got this in the center so that's the first way to set the child of the widget in the center of the container and the other way is let's comment this out and wrap this widget to the center widget so we wrap this text widget to the center widget which is the child of the container Control S to hurt reload so again we got this in the center so that was the second way to put the child of the container in the center and the third way for this is let's also remove the center from here and wrap this child with the widget and that widget is the align which again accept the alignment as we had for the container and simply copy this alignment center in here and paste it in here just like this now control s to hot reload so this will still remain in the center just because that's work the same so there are these three ways to put the widget or the child of the container in the center so you can use any you want but the most reliable and good practice will be that if you only set the only alignment property to center just because this will not make us write more code or wrapping our child widget of the container with other widgets like center and the align control s to hot reload so that will be good just like this so now what we are going to do one more thing here we have to do is to put the new user create account or we can also say don't have an account create account so for that we have to pass right after this container some size box let's copy this 25 size box from here and paste it right after this container Control S to hurt load it moves a bit up just because we have put the size box in here and now our text will comes in here and that will be don't have an account just asking to the user if you don't have an account you can go for the sign up to create your account we can also write the sign up but let's say the create account to make it clear Control S to hurt reload and we got this don't have an account in here but we want this stuck at the bottom in here so for that what we have to do in here we will simply cut this and remove the size box from here again Control S to hurt reload so this will be just like this now go a bit up in here and wrap this container with the other column and close this container which has this column meaning that this content and right after this put the text widget and again expand this container widget expanded now control s to hot reload so you can see we got the don't have an account at the bottom so what this means meaning that we simply wrap this column which has this all of this content in here we wrap this column with the expanded widget to take all the available space in here and simply put that column on top of that and put that don't have an account text widget in here so this content which has which is in this column took all the available space in here so that's why this text widget only take the only space this required so all the space is gotten by this container or this column just because we have wrapped in the expanded widget and this text widget is outside from this expanded widget so it got only a little space in here so that's how we set this text at the bottom this all content which is in the column we wrap this in the container and make it expanded in the column so at the main x alignment of the column this stack all the available space and again make this at the bottom so just like this we can do to make this at the bottom or to move this at the bottom not make it anyways so now we want some space at the bottom so for that what you have to do again there are two ways to do it the first way is to put the size box and height 20 let's say and control as to hurt load so we got it just like this but one more way is to let's remove the size box from here and wrap this text with the container and set the margin let's say margin edge inset start symmetric not the symmetric but the only and from the bottom and 20 so this will work the same you can see it did not move so it means it works the same but one more way in here is let's control z to undo and that is 
the way of wrapping this text widget with the padding widget this is also an external widget to give some padding from outside to any particular widget so we can also use this padding instead of the container and putting the margin so instead of this we can also use the padding so here we will simply set the from all not from the all side but again the only bottom 20 Ctrl S to hurt load and it will did not move just because that worked the same. So we got our simple login page in place. So let's again see what we have done in here. First of all, we have uncommented these assets to use the assets in our application. We add this flutter PNG in here and also in the main dart we have put the column. First we had only this column and we have wrapped this with the container to give some horizontal spacing just like this and in the row we got the image and the text and we got some horizontal size box with the width and also some vertical size box with the height of the size box and the text field to create its text field the input decoration is for the text field and for the container we have the box decoration and we have hint text which is email and password you can see it in here and again these two fields and again the container with the width of 300 height of 50 alignment at the center meaning that its child will be aligned at the center and the box decoration color is blue some rounded borders using this border radius and the text login and also some size not the size but the style for the text and to put this don't have an account create account at the bottom we simply have done put this all content in the other column and wrap this all content in the expanded widget so it will take all the available space and the only remaining space will give to this widget which is located in here right after this expanded widget meaning that it got all the available space and give only the little space or the remaining space to it so we got just like this in the bottom so now let's open this and you can compare it we got the flutter and just like this two email and password fields the forget password the button and you can also change the size of it to let's say 25 to it will so it will be just like this and after this we have the new user create account and we got the don't have an account create account and we can also increase the size of it let's say the in the text we can say the style text style and font size to 16 so that will be good so we got our login page in here the task for you will be to create the sign up page so it will be really simple everything will remain the same simply you have to create one more field on top of the email and password and that hint text will be the username and the forgot password will be removed from here and the login will be changed to register or the sign up and instead of don't have an account you have to put the already have an account login or sign in so that will be the task for you to do it it will be really simple as i have explained in here so that was our login page in flutter so we have seen so many widgets on our fixed ui of our emulator now what if we want to have some scrollable layout on our emulator device for that purpose flutter give us the widget list view which is far more simple and easy to use widget as compared to the native android development of list view or scrollable view because in native android there is a lot of manual configuration for building a list view or a scrollable view in the emulator anyways let's talk about what is list view widget in flutter so it's obvious from its name list view meaning that the scrollable list of views or widgets again if you have some native android development background so you might be familiar with something called view and in flutter the list view is defined as the scrollable list of widgets arranged linearly and it displays its children one after another in the scroll direction and the direction can be vertical or also the horizontal. So now let's see how we can create the list view in our Flutter application. So down here we have the material app and also the home page. So let's not think we only can call this home page widget in here. We can also call the other widgets in here like we have the in the four lesson we have learned the how can we create the login page. So we have this login page. So if you add this column with the widget and make it scaffold and change this child to body and give it some app bar app bar class and give it some title 
text and let's name it login page now after this as you can see this is our stateless widget so we can just copy this login page from here and in the main.dart let's simply paste this login page on the place of home page and simply import this library or we can also say our dart file hit enter so this will be imported in here you can see it in here and now when you press ctrl s to hot reload so you can see we got our login page which we have created in the previous section of login page so now let's again call this home page in here so now we are going to build or learn how we can deal with list view in flutter so down here we have the center widget so let's remove the center widget from here and put the list view in here so we got the list view with the list of children so the same like the list rows and columns the list view also accept the list of children and inside this we are not going to create any container but in here we have some special widget in the list view that is the list tile widget the list tile widget is used to populate the list view and this gives us so many widgets like title subtitle leading and the trailing like we can populate our list view using its properties its most important properties are leading title subtitle and also the trailing the leading means the widget that will be aligned at the leading like in here and the title will be aligned in here and the subtitle will be down here or right after this title and the trailing will be at the end so that are the main widget of list style which is used to populate the list view so first of all in the leading if you hover this leading it accept the widget so we are going to have a container in the leading property so in the leading property we have created a widget of container we give it width of 50 and height of 50 and the decoration box decoration the color is gray and we set the shape of this container box shape dot circle so it will become directly the circle or you can also do with the border radius like you can set the border radius to 25 so it will become the circle but this is also the good way to do it by just changing its shape to box shape dot circle and next we have this title which accepts also the widget so in here we will pass our text widget just because that is the title so obviously there will be some text and next we have this subtitle so there will also be some text just like this title so let's copy this username from here and paste it in the subtitle and change it to let's say some description and the trialing this also accept a widget so in the trialing we are going to have one icon so up until now we have learned so many widgets but we don't know how to have icon in flutter to have icons in flutter we have the widget of icon and its constructor accepts the icon data so to access the icons from it we have the class icons and from here we can access a lot of icons of flutter which comes from the icons class so here we are going to put the icon of let's say delete and that was it now control as to hot reload so you can see we got our list style in here that is the container which we have set the width and height box decoration color gray and circle and that's the title that's the subtitle and there's the trailing icon which we have set here in the delete which looks something like our whatsapp application so now what if we want some so many widgets in here to see its scrollable view in the list view so now we will copy this first of all let's put comma in here and we will copy this and paste it so many times to have the scrollable view in our list view widget so in the children of list view we will paste this list style so many times so i have just copy and paste this list style 20 times now control s to hot reload and we got this beautiful scrollable view of users so that's how we can get the scrollable view using our list view widget and just putting the widgets list style or others so that's how we can have the list view or the scrollable view in our flutter application and that was also it for the list style widget of flutter but if you look at in here we have duplicated the code so many times and you can see we have just trod or got so many line of course that are about 308 or 313 so that is not the good practice to do it to overcome this issue 
to not just duplicating our code by pasting the list style so many times the list view has some constructors that are if you click in here in front of the list view if you put the dot notation in here we have three more constructor of list view that is separated builder and also the custom so first of all we are going to talk about the list view builder so let's remove the children from the list just like this and now let's go and use the builder constructor of list view so put a dot in here and the builder so we will get a compile time error in here so what's the builder mean the builder constructor of list view construct a repeating list of widgets and unlike simple list view it reduce a lot of boilerplate code so let's see how this works so we got this constructor which has so many properties but the most important and the required property is the item builder that is in here and it accepts a function of context to pass the build context and also the index and then the open body and here we are going to return the widget that will be generated so many times so now to specify how many times our list view builder will generate the specific widget so for that we have the property of item count in the list view builder and here we will pass the number of items that we want to generate that times in the item builder so let's say we again want the 20 items to be generated by the item builder and in the return we will return the same list style we have created in here so we got this list style again in the return of the item builder of this so unlike the simple list view this builder constructor is going to build this single item we have returned from this item builder 20 times now control s to hot reload and this will returns our results in the same you can see we got the same 20 widgets in our ui but we have reduced a lot of boilerplate code by using just this builder constructor of list view so whenever you want to build some list of users or some list of widgets or anything you want on your ui so you must prefer this list view builder constructor but not the simple list view just because that will just increase the line of course and nothing else so next in the list view if you do not specify this item count that is not compulsory in here let's comment this out and control s to hurt reload and we will get the infinite list of widgets in here you can see that will never ends if you go at the bottom so we got infinite widgets in here so we must specify the item count if you want to have the specific items times what we want to repeat this item builder to build that times our widget on our ui so that will be good so that was the builder constructor of list view and the next constructor of the list view is list view separated so what it means the list view dot separated constructor is used to generate a list of widgets but in addition a separator widget can also be generated to separate the widgets unlike the builder constructor here the item count is compulsory like we cannot comment out the item count but it's compulsory in here like we must have to specify the item count in here so we will uncomment this item count in here and here one more property is required that is the separator builder so the compile time error will be gone and this also accept the context and the separator and now you'll open the body of it and this is going to return a separator so the separator will be let's say the container and put the semicolon in here as this is returning from a function and we will set its height to 20 and its width will be let's say double dot infinity double dot infinity means the max width and here we will also specify the color of it that will be colors dot let's say blue accent now control s to hot reload so we got the blue separator in our widgets of list view so that's what it the separated list view constructor means and next constructor of the separated list view is the list view dot custom so what this means now let's remove the separator builder the item count and also the item builder but in here let's cut this list style just because we are going to need it in a while so let's remove everything from here and this list view custom is used to build the list of views with custom functionality 
here we have the main parameter in the list view custom that is children delicate so this children delicate is going to accept either the slaver child list delicate or the slaver child builder delicate so the slaver child list delicate will work the same as we had for the simple list view and the slaver child builder delicate will work the same as the builder constructor of list view like also test it out let's remove this builder from here and also simply put in here the slaver child list delicate and this accept the list which is the again the list of children and simply paste this list view or list style in here control s to hurt reload and we got the same one item in here as we had in the simple list view but that but as this is custom so it allows us to have both functionalities like the simple list view and also the builder so that was our simple list view now let's remove the slaver child list delicate remove this list and put the builder in here and also now this will give us the compile time error remove this list just because now it is going to accept the the function and the context and the index and open body and it's going to return this so if we control s and hot reload so we'll get the same result as we had for the list view builder constructor of list view there are infinite list of widgets just because we have to specify one property in here as we had the item count we have the child count in here so we'll simply set the child count to 10 for now so we will get only 10 items you can see that is not scrollable just because that are not so many items so if we set it let's say again 20 control s to hurt load and we again got the same list view builder behavior in the list view custom sliver child builder delicate so that was a three constructor of list view and also the simple work of list view. So we learned about list view to have some scrollable view on our emulator or mobile device. And also we learned about the different kinds of constructor of list view. Now what if you want to have some scrollable widgets in grid in our UI. For that purpose Flutter gave us the grid view widget. And again the grid view is also obvious from its name like to show up something in the grid and in flutter grid view widget displays the items or widgets in two dimensional rows and columns to see it practically let's go and use this grid view widget also in our flutter application so down here we have again this center widget let's remove it and put the grid view in here so we got the grid view in here and same like the row and column stack and list view this also accept the list of children but with this this also accept one more property that is grid delicate that grid delicate controls the layout of children within the grid view and this grid delicate except if you hover it this except the sliver grid delicate so our grid delicate will be sliver grid delicate with cross fix access count and this also accepts one more property that is the cross access count like how many widgets are there will be in our grid view aligned horizontally so we will specify it too like we are going to have one or two widgets in the grid but if you specify three so we are going to have like one two and three one two and three just like in the grid so let's say we are going to have two for now and we will test also the three and four so for now let's keep it like this cross axis count two and here in the children we are going to have again some containers to have some boxes to show up in the grid so let's say we have a container in here so we got this one container with some width and height and decoration box decoration and border radius is 10 like to have some rounded corners and the color light green now let's copy this and paste it four times so we got one container four times in the children of our grid view now control s to hurt reload so we got these four grid containers or boxes on our ui you can see some little spaces between them as they had some rounded corners so to give some space between them we have some properties in the sliver grid delicate with fixed cross axis count that are the main axis spacing let's say 10 and the cross axis spacing also 10 the main axis spacing is vertical spacing and the cross axis spacing is the horizontal spacing now control s to hurt reload so we got some spacing between the four grid items which have which we have in the grid view and also there is a property padding which accepts the edge inserts dot all let's say 10 control s to hurt reload and we got also the padding from 
all the sides of these containers inside the grid view. And what if we increase the items in our grid view? Let's copy this and paste it five more times. Let's say one, two, three, four, and five. Control S to hurt reload, and we got a scrollable grid view in here, just like the list view. So that's how we work with a simple grid view in our Flutter application. So same like the list view, we have some different constructor also for the grid view. Let's look at them also. So in here we have this grid view. So this has the constructor of let's say grid view builder that is similar to the list view builder. So let's copy one container from here and remove this child from here just because the builder do not accept any child or children in here but instead this accepts the item builder so we got the item builder same like the list view it accepts the context which is this build context of our build method and the index like how many items will be there in the grid view and this return a container and in the grid view builder again the item count is not compulsory like if we do not specify any item count so this will give us the infinite grid view items in the emulator so now let's specify also the item builder not the item builder but the item count let's say 20 control s to hot reload so we'll get 20 grids on our emulator so that's how the builder constructor of grid view works and the next constructor of grid view is the grid view custom which works the same as we had for the list view let's copy this container from here and remove this builder from here also the item count just because this is going to accept the child delicate and also the grid delicate so the grid delicate will be again the sliver grid delicate with fixed cross axis count and the cross axis count will be this time let's say 3 and main axis spacing will be 10 and again cross axis spacing will also be the 10 and again this children delicate is going to accept the sliver child list delicate so this will simply accept a list and if you pass the containers in here let's say one container and copy it and paste it one more time one more and one more and also let's say two more times control s to hurt reload so we got the six grid in here just because we have set the cross axis count to three and that was a simple custom grid view with the sliver child list delicate but in, but in case if you pass the sliver child grid delicate so this will simply work as the grid view builder so you can also try this out so now simply remove these containers from here and let's try out the other constructor of grid view so the other constructor of grid view is grid view count and this do not accept the grid delicate so the grid view and the grid view builder and the grid view custom let us specify the delicate or grid delicate explicitly like we can specify the grid delicate and simply we can put the sliver grid delicate with fixed cross axis count and specify all these properties like cross axis count man axis passing man axis or cross axis passing but in case of the grid view count and grid view extent the other constructor after this grid view count they do not explicitly accept the grid delicate but instead they are implicitly accept this like let's cut this from here this sliver grid delicate with fixed cross axis count and remove this grid delicate from here and paste this in here and also comment it out just because we are going to need their properties or values so this accept the cross axis count directly and the cross axis count will be the three and and the main axis passing will be let's say 10 and the cross axis passing will be 10 and this also accept the padding and then it accept the children same like the simple grid view now again pass the container in here so we got the same container as we had in the simple grid view and this will work the same if we paste it again and again in here let's say four times and also put the comma right after this container and control s to hurt reload so we got these in here and this works the same but only the difference is this do not accept the grid delicate explicitly but it accept it implicitly like you can see the values we have specified it directly in here but in case of the grid view builder grid view custom and the simple grid view 
it was accepting the grid delicate and again the sliver grid delicate with fixed cross axis count and then inside this this was accepting the properties like the cross axis count man axis spacing cross axis spacing so this was the only difference between the simple grid view grid view builder and the custom grid view and that works all the same if we specify the four and this will become just like this and we specify five this will become like this and if we increase or copy this container one more times and paste it so this will become just like this and also we have one more container not the container but the constructor that is the grid view extent and this do not accept the cross axis count but instead it has the property of max cross axis extent which is a property which plays a key role in displaying the items of grid views like let's say if you specify the 200 so this will show up the let's say the cross axis count 3 and if we increase or copy container and paste it one more time so it will be just like this but in case if you specify let's say 1000 so this will become only one single grid and this will be scrollable just like this and if we start decreasing it like let's say 50 so this will become like this if we make it 60 so this will work just like this and that was the extent constructor of grid view and that was how it works and we'll go in more depth about these grid view and list view and also the row and column as tag if you go for real app development in Flutter. Now there is one more widget just same as list view and the grid view that is page view to show some transition between different pages on our emulator or mobile device. And with this our one week is almost ended. After this section or after this page view widget we are going to build an onboarding screen by utilizing this page view a bit more in depth. So on the left window of directories we have the lessons and the week 1 where we have the week 1 row and columns, flexible and expanded, stack widget with some position widgets, login page and the flutter list view and also the grid view. So if you want to get code from here so you can simply get the code from github just from here. So now let's see how we can use the page view widget in our flutter application. So down here we have again the center. And in the app bar we have the page view so now let's remove the center and put the page view in here so we got the page view in here with a list of children same like the grid view and the list view and this list of children is going to be the list of widgets same as the grid view and the list view and this page view will return its children in the form of pages that will be scrollable horizontally or vertically you will see it in a while so these children can be widgets you can also create the external widgets like to create any other status widget and simply call it in here. But for now, let's keep these widgets only the containers. Let's create three containers in here. So we got these three containers in our page view as the children of page view. And this container has the color red and a center child widget and the child of center is a text widget. And inside this we have the page 1 like this first container will be our page 1 and the second container will be our page 2 and the third container will be our page 3. Now control us to hurt the Lord and we got these pages and we can swipe between these pages just like this with beautiful transition between them. And also we can change their scroll direction the property of page view that is the property of scroll direction and this accepts the axis just like this and from this axis we can access the either horizontal or vertical so so by default it's horizontal so let's make it vertical now control s to hurt reload and we can now horizontally swipe between the pages and again these containers also can be your external widgets either stateless or stateful so that's how you can use the page view widget in flutter so now in the page view if you want to listen the pages each time it switch for that we have the property of on page change in the page view widget the on page change property accepts a function and accepts a value just like this and this value will be the index of our page on which we are currently on so let's print this value to see it also so each time when page changed using the on page change method we are simply printing the index of that particular page now control s to hot reload and to see the print statements we have the run console open it up and when we switch between page or swipe you can see we got 
the one in here it means we are on one index if you go back we got zero just because we are on zero index if you go again forward and in here we got again one and we got two so that's how we can listen to our current page we are on and also there is one more property of page view that is physics close this and the physics this accepts the scroll physics and the scroll physics can be either bouncing scroll physics and some scroll physics and also never scrollable physics so let's try out the bouncing scroll physics for now bouncing scroll physics control s to hurt reload and we got these bouncing scroll physics you can see these are the bouncing scroll physics of page view and this can also be in the grid view or, or also in the list view and the scroll physics which is that physics are by default already applied on the page view list view or the grid view control s to hurt load you can see this behavior of scrolling physics is the default behavior of page view list view grid view just like that and we have also the never scrollable scroll physics control s to hurt load now we will never be allowed to scroll between the pages and also to control the pages of page view we have the page controller now let's create the page controller in our state so for that we have to convert the stateless widget to stateful widget and in here in the state we are going to create the page controller so we got the page controller its name is page controller we also initialize this page controller so using this page controller variable we will control our pages as this is not scrollable by setting the never scrollable scroll physics we are now not interacting or not allowed to interact with these pages so we will use this controller to interact with these pages of page view widget so this page view controller also accept the initial page like let's say pass the one now control s to hot reload or hot restart the application so we will get nothing just because copy it and in the page view it accepts also the controller also pass the page view controller now how to start the application and we will get the second page as our initial page you can see we got the page 2 as this is the second page or on the one index so now we'll use this page controller to control our page so in the app bar we have one more property of app bar that is action to create the action button the action button of app bar are aligned here at the right side of app bar so now we are going to learn one more widget of flutter that is the icon button the icon button means that will be a button which accepts the on press method to like when you press this so what will happen and also one icon for that icon button so to create icon button we have the widget of icon button just like this as i said it accepts the on press method and also the icon widget so on the on press method that will be a function so open body just like this and we are going to perform some action using the icon button and this icon will be let's say icon icons dot arrow back ios and put comma in here and duplicate this and also change this back to forward now control s to hot reload and we got these two buttons in here which for now not working and now we are going to perform some actions on these in here in the body of on press of these two buttons so inside the on press we are going to do as this is arrow back ios mean the back button so using the page controller we will do page controller dot animate to page and this method animate to page except the page in here the index of the page like from one index where we want to go when you when we press the back button so we want to go back to the zero index and the duration except the duration like in how many times or how much time you want to go back to the zero index so this accept duration widget and this duration widget accept the millisecond days hours microseconds minutes and seconds so we will pass the milliseconds and 500 and the curve is the behavior of when the page switch or swiped so this except the curves and there are lots of behaviors so we will use the ease in out so that will be the same behavior for the forward method so copy this page controller and paste it also in here only change this index to 2 and now when we click this forward so we come to the page 3 when you click this backward we come to page 1 when you click again this you will this will get take us to the page 3 
to the index 2 and when we again click this this will take us to the zero index page which is our page one and alternatively we can also use the instead of animate to page we can use the previous page which do not accept any index of the page so let's remove it and in the forward we can also use the next page which also do not accept any index of page so that will be just like this now control s to hold reload when we click this this will take us forward just like this when you click this back so this will take us backward and we can again change the axis to horizontal control s to hold reload now this will become horizontal just like this so that was the page view and that's how you can control it using this page controller and also these are some properties of it and next we have the page view custom and the page view builder the page view custom is same as the list view custom grid view custom just like like from here we can also have the sliver child list delegate and the sliver child builder delegate so it means inside the custom we can also have the builder behavior and the simple list view or the page view behavior so what you have to do simply cut this one container from here and remove these two containers from here just because we are going to use the page view builder remove these children and make this builder just like this now it again accept the item builder so we got the item builder with the context and the index and this item builder is going to return our container widget so we got this container returned by this item builder of page view so we got this page 3 in here but inside this we also have to specify the item count that will be let's say 10 Ctrl S to hurt reload and now we are going to have the 10 pages in place like click this you can see we are navigating to the same page again and again just because here we are going to return the let's say instead of 3 we will say the page on the specific index Ctrl S to hurt reload we got the page 6 and you can see page 4 5 3 2 1 and 0 and this will be from 1 to 9 like 5 6 7 8 and 9 just because we have to set it to 10 item count and that's how this works if you remove this scroll physics from here if you remove the scroll physics from here and simply pass it the bouncing scroll physics or simply scroll physics so this will become also the scrollable just like this this is bouncing crawl physics so this so that's why this has the behavior like this so we can also scroll between the pages like this and we can also switch the page just like this by clicking this arrows here and the page view custom is the same this is not going to accept the item count and the item builder so let's remove this from here that's good now this accept the children delicate and this children delegate can be sliver child list delegate and same as the simple page view this accept the list of children and for builder instead of this list we are going to have the builder just like this and now this is going to accept the context and index and the open body and in the body this is going to return the same container and inside this this also accept the child count same as the item count in the builder constructor of page view so that's how its constructor custom and the builder works and that was some properties of it like physics scroll direction on page change the controller and here this was the icon button the action button of app bar and this was the page controller and you'll learn more in depth this page view in the next videos when you go for real app development so now with that knowledge of flutter basic widgets let's go for a bit complex topic so now we are going to learn how to build onboarding screens just like this for our flutter application so first of all we are going to add the images in our assets directory in here so we got these three images in our asset directory the image one looks something like this and the image two looks like this and the image three is just like this as we have here in the test project so now let's go to the pubspec.yaml file and pubkit just because we have added some images in our assets and it need to get these images so that we will be allowed to use these in our flutter application so after the pubkit completes let's close this console from here and go to your main dot dot so down here again we have the center widget but first we are not going to touch the center for now 
So there are two ways to create these onboarding screens for our Flutter application. The one way is Spaghetti and the other is Clean. The Spaghetti one is like we can create these three pages by just creating three separate stateless widgets and inside each page just hard code the data of every single page like the image, the title, the subtitle and the dot of selected page. But doing this is not going to be a good practice because we are duplicating a lot of code which is really not a good practice. And the main purpose of this bootcamp is just to follow and focus on the principle of clean code and the separation of concern. So we are going to have an entity class which will hold a list of data like the title, description, the image and the specific index on which the page is selected. And then we will use the page views builder constructor and will build the number of pages according to the size or the length of the list. And to display each page, we are going to have only one stateless widget which will accept the data dynamically and the data will comes from the list according to the specific index of the list. So with that understanding, let's go and create the onboarding entity class. So for now, we have learned the seven widgets in our week one. So let's create one more directory in here and name the directory 8. So we got this 8 directory. Now inside this 8 directory, let's create one dart file or library and name it onboarding. So inside this 8 directory, we got this onboarding dart file or the library. Now inside this, we are going to have one class with the name of onboarding entity. So we got this onboarding entity class and this class is going to have three final fields that will be title, description and the image. So we got these three fields inside the class. They are final fields meaning that they will not be changed and their type is string and next there is a compile time error meaning that just create the constructor for these fields. And we got the constructor for our onboarding entity class. As you have learned in the course of Dart, the constructor name is same as the name of the class and all the fields are required just like this. And next we are going to have the list of onboarding entity and its name is onboarding data which is going to accept our onboarding data like the image, the title and the description. And you are already familiar with this list of onboarding entity meaning that this list is going to accept only the onboarding entity type elements. And you are already familiar with the generics or the type safe collections. And inside this, we are going to have the data of onboarding. So we got three objects of onboarding entity class. And inside this, we have initialized all the variables with the title, description and the image. The title is order your wish. Description is you can order everything you love to eat. And just like this, the title, description and the image for three of the other pages. The first object will be for the first page and the second object will be for the second page and the third object will be for the third page and they will come according to the specific index in the page view builder. So that was it for our onboarding entity class and now let's go to main.tart and create one stateless widget which will dynamically accept the title, description, image and the index. So inside the main.dart right after this home page we will create one stateless widget. So we got the stateless widget with the name of onboarding item. And this is going to accept the three final fields in the constructor. So let's create these fields. So we got the title, description, image and the index. And also the onboarding item is accepting these fields in the constructor just like this. And now in the build method, this is going to build the UI for each page in the page view builder. So this is going to return the column and will build the UI for each page in here. Like every page layout is the same, one column, one image on the top, title, description and the selected index dot. And in here we have again the column, the title, description and the selected index dot. And same for this third one. So we are going to have only one single stateless widget and will accept the dynamic data from the list. So here, first of all, we are going to have the column and remove this placeholder from here. So we got the column in here and the main axis alignment of the column will be in the center just because you can see we have all the content aligned in the center 
of main axis alignment of the column. And inside the column, we are going to have a center widget and the child of the center widget, we are accessing the image dot asset and the path of the image, which is assets and slash and the image will comes dynamically and the name of the image is already specified in the onboarding entity like image one dot png. And this will be accessed from according to the specific index in the page view builder. So you will see it in a while. So in the main data, next we are going to have the size box height 20 and next we are going to have the text which accepts the title dynamically which will build the different for each of the page and its style except the text style font size is 30 font weight is bold and after this again we are going to have a size box of 20 and right after this one more text and this is going to accept now the description and the text align is in the center and the style text style font size is 18 and its color is gray you can see it also in here in the test project and now you will run this code so you will see this also in action so right after this we are going to have the size box of height 50 just because these three dots are aligned a bit far away from this content and next we are going to have the row and the main axis alignment of the row will also be in the center and in the child of the row we are going to have three containers of 10 width and height and in the box decoration each container or the circle has the box shape circle and in the color for each of the container or the circle box we are checking using the expression operator we are saying if the index was equally equal to zero so that color of this first container will be black otherwise it will be gray and for the second container or the second circle we are saying if the index was equal equal to one so its color will be black otherwise gray and the same for the second or the third container we are saying if the index was equal equal to two so its color will be black otherwise the gray so this was our single item for our onboarding and now in here we are going to have the page view builder so we got this page view builder with the item count 10 and the item builder context and index and in the return it is returning simply center in the child each index so it will return the 10 pages just for testing it out if it's working or not so now that is our test application now let's move to our real application here so we got our zero in here and we can swipe between the pages you can see in here to show you that nothing is built for now so now we are going to access the list from this onboarding entity this onboarding data so to access it directly let's make it static so the static means we can directly access the onboarding data list from this onboarding entity class like we don't have to create the instance of the class or the object of the class create the object and then access this onboarding data from the instance of the class but instead we can directly access it when we create or make a variable so we have the static method inside the class so it means we can directly access it from the class so now go to the main dot dot and in here in the state we are going to have the list of onboarding entity and the name of the variable and make it equal to and from onboarding entity class just access the onboarding data from here so now there is a compile time error just because we have to import this onboarding dot dot library this class is located in this library or this file so we have to also import it so alt enter and also import this library from the 8 directory and onboarding dot dot so we got imported this library in here now in the item count we will pass the onboarding data dot length so we have three items in the list so we will get only three pages according to that and then we are not going to return the center in here but we will return the onboarding item and the title will be accessed from the onboarding data on specific index title and for the description we will do the same onboarding data on specific index get the description and for the image we will do the same onboarding data on specific index get the image now after this control s to hot load so we got this in here and the assets are not loaded so it means i have to close my main dot dot and run it again so after running this again we got this image in here 
So we got this image in here, the title, the description and the dot selected here. Now this condition in the item is true. That row in that first container, now the index is equal equal to zero. So we got this container color black and the others two are false. So that's why their colors is gray. So when we go for the next, so now this second container condition is true now the index is equal equal to one so we got this color black and that's how it works also for this third container like when you go in here so that's how it works so we have successfully created the onboarding screen and that's how you can create the onboarding screens for your application so we have done this using the fully clean way we have created the entity class and we got the fields in here and we got the list static in here to not access it from the object but directly access from the class name and in here we got three instances of the class and the data of image description and title and we create the onboarding item which access the data dynamically and we pass the data according to specific index in here and then in the result we got this beautiful onboarding screen in here and that's how you can create the onboarding screens for your application so that was it for this week so goodbye and i will see you in the next week